glue is cheap.
does this usually take? The shape bring an immediate return. Shoot the radar into the ground and the bone bounces the image back. Bounces it back. This new program's incredible. Mm. Two more years development and we won't even have to dig anymore. Where's the fun in that? It's a little distorted, but I don't think it's a computer. Oh. Post-mortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Velociraptor? Yeah, it's good shape, too. It's five, six feet high. I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extra... What'd you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, they got it in for me. <laughs> and look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. There's no one of these guys learn how to fly. That doesn't look very scary. More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> turkey, huh? Turkey. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae, full of air sacs and hollows, more just like, like a bird. More like a six-foot turkey. And <laughs> Turkey. Six foot turkey. Turkey. Six foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. Get your first look at this six foot turkey and see whether it's clear. Everybody and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's really good to have all of you here. So glad you could join me on this beautiful Friday afternoon. I'm glad you could make it. Today, we're going to be doing some Q&A, maybe going to do a little bit of fossil news. We'll be having a review game of who wants to be a millionaire, or rather, who wants to be a paleontologist. Uh, very, very rarely do those two categories overlap. Um, anyway, welcome everybody. If it's your first time here, then let me give you an extra special welcome and let me introduce myself. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. I dig up dinosaurs across the American West with various museums. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. And uh, at present, I talk about dinosaurs five days a week right here on Twitch. This is how I make my living nowadays, believe it or not. And your support allows me to do that. So thank you to all of the supporters out there who have allowed me to become, I guess you could call me the world's first full-time live streaming paleontologist 
Kind of crazy. That's the world we live in, you know? Thank you for your support. Like you, Golganak. Holy cow. Golganak, thank you, thank you very, very much. Holy cow. I really appreciate that, Golganak. <laughs> and has helps? Enjoy that gift sub. Yeah. Uh, you won't have to watch any ads for the next 30 days, thanks to Golganak's generosity. Those of you who are subscribed in a recurring basis, you don't have to watch ads on this channel at all. And you're supporting science outreach and education, research and fieldwork through paleontologizing. So thank you, thank you. Yeah. Aditya says, the world's first dinosaur influencer. Ooh, really? Yep, Victarius. Thank you for helping us put together those clues through your generosity there, Victarius. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Tommy Plodicus. Holy moly. Appreciate that also very much. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Six out of 50 already. Yeah, that is three twenty-fifths of the way there. If we reduce that fraction down. Good stuff, Chad. Thank you, thank you so much. Tommy Platicus, thank you for the gift sub. Victorious, thank you for the three subs. Golganek, thank you for the gift sub. And Lenina, thank you for the gift sub to Arlay. <laughs> Arlay, it's great to see you here. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Before we get into our uh, our fossil news, we're going to have some fossil news teasers before we get to the real fossil news on Monday. Um, but we've got a brand new genus and species of dinosaur just described, just published on today. We'll be talking about that on Monday. And if you want a sneak peek, well, stay tuned. We're going to go over that in a little bit. Also, I've got a weird schedule next week, so stay tuned for that, too. When I get through the introductions, when I get through the greetings, saying hello to everybody, we'll talk about that. Um, I've already lost the top of chat. Holy cow. But we have Claire Burr. Howdy, howdy, Claire. How you doing? Uh, Coley Online. How are you doing, Coley? I think we also had Jody Fish, Smorphosaurus, Kodali up at the top, probably Golganek. Uh, and a few others, uh, whose chats are now lost in the sands of time. Uh, but I appreciate you being here nonetheless. Um, Kirsten Games, howdy howdy. We don't have too many sound commands right now. <clears throat> Except, moderators are allowed to use the exclamation mark hey command. Which moderators, you can use that right now if you'd like to, just to demonstrate. But that's if, like, something goes wrong and I'm not paying attention or I'm not aware of it. That's it right there. Yeah. You can do it again if you'd like, moderators. I'll pause the music so people can hear it better. But, uh... Yeah, there we go. So if that's happening, usually there's... It means I gotta sit up and pay attention. That's like moderators pushing the red button. Um, but yeah, Farf, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Farf. It's good to have you here. Neilf, howdy, howdy. Good to see you, Neilf. Kodali, Tradoon to you too, Kodali. Golganek, what's shaking? Trappy Jenkins, how are you? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. And who else have we got? Moonrise Rabbit. How are you doing, Moonrise Rabbit? Happy Friday to you. And holy cow, look at this. Ontogeny. What happened there? That was a little strange. Was that a gift sub? Hang on a moment here. I'm Check my uh, activity feed. I didn't do that. Did somebody else do that? Uh. Yeah. That's strange. Yeah. Hey, let me let me try something real quick. Um yeah, it didn't work. Bizarre! Anyway. Uh Rat Acid Lenina, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome Lenina. Welcome Rat Acid. Welcome MS Coggins. Welcome Tommy Plodicus. Hello to all of you. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's so good to have you here today. Chris T S with the Apatosaur there. How you doing, Chris T S? Welcome, welcome. 
Uh, who else do we have got? Has helps. How are you doing? So glad you got a gift sub there. Has helps. And Sofia Borboya says, "I just arrived. What are we looking at, Sofia? Bienvenidos a paleontologia." Yeah. Que pasa? It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Oscar Juniors, howdy, howdy, Freya Eloise. How are you, Freya? Uh, Brow. Hello to you, Brow. Welcome, welcome. Adita Yokar. Again, said the world's first dinosaur influencer. That's like a dirty word to be influencer. Ugh. 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 Gross. Um. <laughs> Remember when I was talking to uh, to Pat Holroyd at UCMP, my old mentor when I was in high school, I told her that I do science outreach full time on Twitch, and she goes, "Oh, so you're an influencer now?" And I just went, "Oh, don't call me that." Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see here. Techrific, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Techrific. Adit just says, did you hear there was a dinosaur skull found in Queensland, Australia? We talked about that yesterday, the skull of Diamantinosaurus. Extremely rare sauropod skull, just published on, from Queensland. Indeed, Aditya, yeah. That may or may not show up on today's quiz, by the way. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and Lordy is here too, how are you doing Lordy? Welcome, welcome. I hope you're having a great day, Lordy. Hope, uh, hope you're enjoying time with your family. It's good to have you here, Lordy. It's good to have you here. Yeah. And let's see. Scrolling, scrolling. Uh, shall I add influencer to the band word list? No, that's okay, Lenny. <laughs> oh, please don't. <laughs> uh... And what's wrong with you that you're an influencer? You know what, Petra Crusader? Uh, yeah, you know? That's an accusation that... Yeah, it's shameful, isn't it? You know? Yeah, influencers. Not good people, typically. Um... That's why I don't like that label. Hmm. <laughs> That's what advertisers want. Advertisers can go... Play leapfrog with a Kentrosaurus there, guest. <clears throat> uh, um, anyway, influencers equals shills. There you go, Techrific. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, there you go. Um, anyway. And content creators. Even that, just like the word content, like leaves a gross taste in my mouth. You know, it, it feels like such a... Like marketing terminology. Uh, like something that would you would hear in a boardroom or in a focus group or something like that. Just... Ugh. 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 Gross. Um... Anyway, I, the whole point of me being here is to share my research and new publications from my field with all of you and try and give you an inside peek into what paleontology is like. You know, try and demystify that. And it's, given that these are live broadcasts, it's always going to be a little bit unpolished, uh, you know, un, unvarnished little rough around the edges. That's just the nature of things, you know? And I weekly get, like, multiple offers via email, like, oh, shill for this product, or, you know, this mobile game, or this, like, food thing that will send to people's houses, and it's way overpriced, and it's a subscription service, or, you know, try and sell... Uh, cigarettes to children or something like that. I'm just, I'm not about that. You know? Like, I feel like, I don't know, maybe at some point, you know, maybe if I have to move and find a new apartment and it's three times as expensive as what I'm paying now, maybe I will have to bite the bullet and 
shill for, I don't know, some sort of horrible gambling website or, uh, you know, pollution factory or something like that. I don't know. But for right now, we can enjoy not having to do that. Just focus on science and, you know, interesting fossil content. Content. Ugh. Fossil science. <laughs> anyway. Dolganek, thank you for gifting Techrific. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Mikey likes this. Would you clone? Would you shill for a company that clones dinosaurs from DNA for an amusement park on an island off South America? Only if they hired me as like an employee. Mikey likes. Cause shoot, I better be involved in a project like that. We'll we'll say that, you know. If that's gonna happen, I better be on the payroll. You know, I'm not gonna be doing banner ads for something like that. You know. Yeah. Um, Freya Eloise says, there are good brand deals you can get. The thing is, nothing nothing that I would want to shill for would actually want me as a brand representative, though. Because they're typically things that don't really need advertising. Like good, sturdy hiking boots, or... Military surplus gear for field work, or like... I don't know. Uh... Veggie burgers that don't taste like sawdust. They don't, they don't need advertisement. Those things are good on their own, you know? However, however, if they were like some sort of anti-advertising thing where one company would pay me to talk garbage, talk trash about another company's product, like get me to talk about how Apple computers are overrated and expensive toys or something like that? I could get behind that. Talk about how Tesla cars are not real cars? I'd get behind that. I don't know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, anyway. Uh, Starlink. <laughs> I'm, I'm in talks with Starlink right now, Golganek. We'll, we'll see if... Right now, I'm extremely under-impressed, bordering on furious, with how nothing about Starlink seems to actually be what it promises. But I'm keeping an open mind about it. And we'll see, uh, we'll see what comes of this. But yeah, yeah... Um, and Freya Eloise says, you can use affiliate links. I've tried to use affiliate links from Amazon, and they always break. Like, the, they can't seem to get their stuff together. Like, I put an affiliate link up, or I think, we'll see if this works. I've got one for my keyboard here. I tried this once, just to see if it works. This is my keyboard, and it comes with a mouse. They're made of wood, you know? And people keep asking me about this, and rather than, like, people kept saying, Danny, where do you get that? So, um, yeah, s see if that link actually works still. Um, I think it might be broken. And yeah, and Tommy Platicus says, Danny on the phone with Starlink. So that's the thing, Tommy Platicus. Starlink doesn't have a phone number. And they don't have an email address. Customer service has to be done through their app, which it actually doesn't work through the app. The app is too buggy. So I can't even pull up customer support tickets on the phone. It's got to be done through their website. And you're completely at them. Like, whenever they choose to respond to you, it's taken, like, three weeks for them to respond to me before for, like, really, really basic stuff. Like, hey, this stuff isn't working. Can you do something about it? And they... Yeah. The only thing that seems to work with Starlink is the process by which they take your money. Nothing else has worked for me so far at all whatsoever. So yeah, yeah. Hmm. The keyboard cost that much? It's gone way up in price. That's nuts. I got mine for like half that. I might want to get rid of that. That's a lot. Uh, 
I don't know. I might consider paying that just for the novelty of having a cool wooden keyboard, but like, I might have to take that down. That seems like too much money. And bamboo's not expensive. <laughs> it's one of the fastest growing materials on the planet, Claire Burt. Oh boy. Odd job. Holy cow, thank you for the 21 months of support. Thank you, thank you, Ajab. And what is the tallest dinosaur? We actually have a, like, definitive answer for that. Holy cow. I'm, uh... I'm really glad you asked, Ajab. Thank you for your continued support, keeping me online for the past 21 months. Thank you, Ajab. Yeah. Uh, the short answer to your question... Uh... The short answer to your question, what is the tallest dinosaur, is indeed... Sora Poseidon. The lizard thunder god, Sora Poseidon. There we go. It is a... We're actually not entirely sure what kind of sauropod it is. Is it a brachiosaur? It is it a titanosaur? Is it a... what? But Sora Poseidon. Yeah... Named by Wadle, Cefeli, and Sanders in the year 2000. Uh, it is from Wyoming and Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Extrapolations based on the more completely known Brachiosaurus indicate the head of Sora Poseidon could reach 16 and a half to 18 meters. 54 feet to 59 feet in height. That's the height of like a five or six story building. Just incredible. Yeah. Uh, however, this animal may not be as closely related to Brachiosaurus as previously thought. So these estimates may be inaccurate. Again, when we're looking at this, the bones that you see there in white are the ones that we actually have. Everything else is reconstructed based on Brachiosaurus. But if this dinosaur actually had a different body shape than Brachiosaurus, then it might not be as tall. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, especially if this is like, you know, a titanosaur or something like that, and it held its neck more straight out in front of it, then it wouldn't be nearly as tall. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the few dinosaurs known from the state of Oklahoma, which is pretty cool. From right there where the red box is. Dink, dink, dink. Right there. Uh, Atoka County. Where uh, Acrocanthosaurus is also from. So yeah. And it may or may not be the same animal as Paluxysaurus. There's a reconstruction of the animal right there. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And Sora Poseidon was an unexpected discovery because it was a huge gas-guzzling gas barge of an animal in an age of some compact sauropods. Uh, and Matt Waddle, who was the, uh, he's the lead author on that paper, stated that there. And, uh... That was not, uh, Broken Link. That's unfortunate. Anyway, Sora Poseidon. Here is a link right there. Yeah, keep these questions coming. This is good stuff. It's good stuff. Uh, Sora Poseidon. Yeah, tech graphic. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and Bald Squirrel. That might be very difficult. <laughs> you have to find a Dino Kairos with gigantic arms to do that job for you, Bald Squirrel. Uh, Golganix says, Evolution, what did you do? <laughs> uh, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, could it possibly be more di diplodocid in stature, says Jody Fish? Probably not. I mean, that's the thing, is that, uh, yeah, the neck vertebrae don't really look, dip look diplodocid. They could be titanosaur, they could be a decreus, well, probably not a decreosaur either. Um, yeah, description... Paleoecology. Uh, 
Yeah, originally described as a Brachiosaurid, closely related to Brachiosaurus and Giraffe Titan. Ooh, remember that name for the quiz later today. The discovery of additional remains in the Cloverleaf Formation of Wyoming suggests that it was more, in, fa in fact, more closely related to Titanosaurs in the group Somphospondyli. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so Saur Poseidon could later be sunk into Paluxysaurus, which is the state dinosaur of Texas. Time will tell, and more fossil discoveries will hopefully clear up that mystery. But right now, we're left with incomplete information and uh, opinions of different researchers. But if you'd like to get some of those opinions on a weekly basis, you should really check out this blog right here. Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week. If you really like sauropods, this is a blog for you. Would be powerless before the, onslaught of the, beast. the what? The beast. I'm sorry. The beast. Again? The, beast. the who? The, the what? The I didn't catch that. One more time? One more time? Uh, Hello all. Rob Suey. Sorry for being hard of hearing, but thank you for the 12 months of support. Really appreciate you keeping me online for the past year. That's pretty extraordinary. Thank you, thank you, Rapsui. Very, very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Something is wrong with your audio? Uh, I don't know about that, Oscar Juniors. You know, famously, we never have anything go wrong on this stream. You know? It... Technical difficulties are one of those things that are just completely unknown on the whole Twitch platform. In fact, I would... <laughs> Excuse me. I'm just kidding. Um, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, excuse me. Still have a bit of a lingering cough from earlier this week when I had uh, bird flu or cholera or um, cerebral meningitis or whatever. I'm feeling like 100% better. Just a little bit of a lingering cough. So yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Mayor Space. People aren't going to run away for that, are they? Or maybe they are. Shoot. I don't know. Um. Well, you know, we're just separating the wheat from the chaff then. So, uh. Hey, a salute to all of the wheat. Still watching right now. You know? Uh, what's the old phrase? Uh, sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell, but loyal paleontologizing viewers stick around even when I pretend that the stream has gone off. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? Yeah. Sauropod picture vertebra of the week. Or sauropod vertebra picture of the week. SV how um this is run by matt wadel and mike taylor and if you really like sauropods and you want to be uh you want to be on the cutting edge of what's going on in sauropod research check out that blog and also check out the uh facebook or facebook twitter page of uh of Kerry Woodruff, who's another sauropod paleontologist. And, uh, yeah. Nope. No, wait, show me the tweet. Here it is. Uh, Kerry was talking about some sauropod news just today. He says, what? Colalillo and uh, Saloinas, 2023, show ontogenetic change in the vertebrae of terrestrial vertebrates with long necks? 
said completely sarcastically. Carrie is very much in tune with the ongoing ontogenetic revolution in dinosaur paleontology. And uh, he says, in all seriousness, though, studies like this are very important. We need every variety of extant ground truthing. And this is a really cool paper here. I don't think I have access to this. But yeah, ontogeny indeed, Victorious. Yeah. Uh, preliminary ontogeny of the giraffe neck. Super, super cool. And yeah, I don't have access to this. Um, but shoot, if I paid $42, they'd send me the PDF. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is looking at, uh, at giraffe necks and how they change as the animals grow and develop. And in noting these changes, we could potentially understand or gain some better clues about how sauropod dinosaur vertebrae would change as these animals are growing and maturing. Because chances are there's a lot going on there. Ontogeny is extraordinarily important for the understanding of, uh, of dinosaur biology. Um, so whatever ontogenetic change giraffes are going through in their neck vertebrae, it's got to be all the more dramatic for sauropods, I would imagine. Can we find a video on giraffe growth, maybe? Uh, um, uh... Okay, let's try this. Um, if your discretion is somewhat advised for this, we might witness the birth of a giraffe, which is a, a wonderful miracle of nature. And also might be kind of slimy and gross. So um, feel free to cover your eyes if it does get a little, uh, yeah, a little grody. But let's see here. Yeah. But as minutes turn to hours, Lady increasingly shows the strains of labor. Okay. The average calf can weigh as much as 150 pounds. Holy cow. So contrast that with a dinosaur, for instance. A sauropod dinosaur, when first born, hatches out of an egg no bigger than a soccer ball. Or a football, for people from other countries. Um, so it's got a tremendous... Uh, it has to grow so much more than, say, a baby giraffe. Baby giraffe, when it's born, is already 150 pounds. A baby sauropod dinosaur would be... I don't know, probably less than 10 pounds? When it first hatches out? So, uh... Yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. It stands to reason that a giraffe, if it's undergoing some major changes in its neck vertebrae as it's growing and maturing from a 150-pound newborn baby to an adult, think about the changes that a sauropod dinosaur would undergo. It's stuff like this that helps kind of underline how we need to be more careful about looking at the anatomy of these dinosaurs in order to test these ideas, you know? Don't overlook the anatomy of juvenile sauropod dinosaurs. Pay close attention to the differences between them and adults so we can actually understand the changes that they undergo so that if you find a new vertebra in the field and you go, this vertebra looks really weird, it's got to be a new species. Well, how can you actually tell whether it's a new species or whether it's just an intermediate ontogenetically between a hatchling and, like... You know, something close to a full-grown sauropod. We're dealing with so little information oftentimes in these cases that it, it really helps to kind of pump the brakes sometimes to go, hang on, hang on, hang on. Is this actually taxonomic diversity they were witnessing? Or is this just big changes from hatchling to an adult, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Ontogeny. Uh, how to make your okapi longer. There you go, Golganek. Okapis are the uh, the closest living relatives of giraffes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and Mr. Knight, the it guy. It's probably IT guy, isn't it? Uh, they say, this is the problem I have. You fit the evidence around the theory instead of allowing the evidence to dictate the theory. Uh, what do you mean by that, Mr. Knight? Could you elaborate? I'm not sure I understand. 
Also, in science, I mean, we use the word hypothesis instead of theory. Theory is something different altogether. So, like, in science, a theory is something big and broad. You know, like the theory of gravity, the germ theory of disease, uh, the theory of evolution, you know? It's kind of like when we say the, the word, the phrase music theory. Theory is like a framework for understanding a bunch of observed facts, a bunch of experiments, a bunch of hypotheses that have been, uh, have failed to be, hy failed to be falsified. Like, they seem provisionally true. That's what theory is in science. I realize that in common parlance, like, theory means something that's much less lofty than that. Like, oh yeah, I've got a theory about who ate all the chimichangas out of the fridge. I think, I think Tim did it. But no, in science, theory is... Oh. Thank you, Warlock Foxfire, for the follow. Welcome. Do a research on that, Oliver. Well, thanks for the follow. Anyway, yeah, yeah. We would say hypothesis in science, I think, for what you mean. But, um... But yeah, yeah. And Brit... All right, we'll... Let's go get Tim. For uh, pilfering those chimichangas. Yeah. So I'm better save you a chimichanga. Take that up with Tim there, Oliver. You know? <laughs> oh. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's up to Tim. Yeah. And holy cow. Prankster fan. Thank you, thank you. Well, listen to this. Really appreciate that, Prankster fan. Thank you very, very much for the raid. And welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? Great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. How did your stream go, first of all? I hope it was wonderful. Welcome to Paleontologizing. If anybody's new here, my name is Danny. I work on dinosaurs. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here to answer your questions and try and give you an inside peek into how fossil science really works. So we're talking about research in paleontology. We're talking about new discoveries. We're talking about how we know what we know about the ancient past. So yeah, yeah. And welcome, Illuminated Siha, prankster fan fan raid. Welcome. Illumi illumi illuminated, sorry, Siha. Siha, it's good to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. And we were streaming chicken cam while working on building the coop. Oh, very cool, Prankster fan. Live chickens? That's awesome. As you well know, Prankster fan, chickens are living dinosaurs. So, yeah. Yeah, pretty cool, Prankster fan. Pretty cool. I hope the chickens are all behaving themselves, and uh, I hope work on the coop has been going well. You keep those raccoons out, and keep those chickens safe. Yeah, my cute little dinos. That's very cool, Prankster. That's really awesome. I'll have to check that out later. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, shoot, we were talking about giraffes, and how in. They might actually provide an interesting analog for dinosaurs in this case. Uh, this new paper that just came out that sauropod researcher Kerry Woodruff was tweeting about. The preliminary ontogeny of the giraffe neck. If we can understand how giraffe necks change as the animals grow and develop throughout their lives, that might give us some hints for stuff to look for when we're looking at sauropod necks, the necks of these long necked plant-eating dinosaurs. Like, uh... Like Sora Poseidon, whom we were just talking about. Yeah. Uh, this critter right here. Or, you know, sauropods in general. Some of whom may have had fairly giraffe-like postures. So let's... Let's take a look at this video right here. This may or may not be a little bit gross, but we're gonna watch it anyway. We're gonna see the miracle of life with some giraffes. But as minutes turn to hours, Lady increasingly shows the strains of labor. Uh, 
Mama Giraffe trying to give birth. Holy cow. Whoop. There we go. To push the baby out, it doesn't seem to be much progress. Oh no! Another hour passes, and Lady is getting tired. Just get it out. Suddenly, Kim and Sherry witness their worst fear. Lady. Oh no! Oh no! Oof. So dinosaurs didn't have to deal with this. They all they all laid eggs, as far as we can tell. Sherry and Kim face a terrible dilemma. They know not to approach a pregnant giraffe under these conditions. And Hunter of the Ancients. <laughs> Thank you for the raid. I appreciate that, Hunter of the Ancients. Thank you very much for the raid. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. New sounds for their three listeners. Howdy, howdy. Thank you for the rate. How did your stream go? I want to hear all about that. Um, we are witnessing a giraffe struggling to give birth on our channel right now. It's a well-timed raid. This poor giraffe mother is trying to birth a calf. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, instead we've had two raids birthed in the meantime. Um, holy cow. But welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. For anybody who's new, my name is Danny. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. If you've got dinosaur questions, you're in the right place, because that's what I study, that's what I publish on, that's what I dig up. Dinosaurs. Now, giraffes might in some ways be an interesting analog to dinosaurs. Um, to certain sauropod dinosaurs, at least, with very tall necks, very long necks and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I always invite my friends to a live video of a giraffe birth with no warning, says Gimplag. <laughs> you must lead an interesting life there, Gimplag. I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I hope I'm not scaring away any raiders here. But yeah. And stream went well, says Hunter of the Ancient. It built the Luke, Luke Skywalker's X-Wing and a Boba Fett ship in Lego. Really? Luke Skywalker's... Uh... Oh, shoot. What's the company? Is it Intec? X-Wing? I used to know all these things when I was a kid. And the Slave One is Boba Fett ship, right? It's a modified uh, Firefly class assault ship or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, pretty neat, Hunter. Pretty neat. Fire spray. Thank you, Claire Burr. Anyway, I, I used to check out those Star Wars books from the school library all the time when I was a kid. So some of that stuff is still rattling around up here in the old noggin, but much of it has been pushed out by, uh, you know, different dinosaur genera and theropod phylogenies and stuff like that. So anyway, those are some of my favorite books, Clever, were the Star Wars books on uh, on ships and stuff. But, uh, and no worries, Hunter. <laughs> hey, I'm right there with you. Right there with you. Anyway, uh, yeah, Oliver says, I don't think Disney wants it to be called Slave One anymore. You know, okay. <laughs> Incom, thank you, the T-65 Incom X-Wing. Thank you, thank you, Claire Burr. Piece of useless information about a fictional universe, but... Anyway, back to the real universe here. Here's a, uh... <laughs> Back to the real world here, people. Here's a giraffe struggling to give birth. Um, reality check. Uh, if Lady feels threatened, she could kick. But if she remains sitting, the baby could be crushed. Ah. Uh, really spectacular. Spared no expense. And Hunter, thank you for the gift sub there. I really appreciate that, Hunter. Thank you, thank you. That's excellent. Uh, thank you for your support. I do this full time, so every last bit of support that I get is very much appreciated. And, uh, it helps put food on my table and helps pay for my research and field work and everything else. So thank you for that. I'm guessing that since this video is up on YouTube, there is a happy ending to it. A pregnant giraffe can but we'll see. 2,000 pounds. 
Knowing they must get Lady to stand back up, they enlist Safari West founder and giraffe expert Peter Lang to do the job. Oh. He'll approach Lady with the hope that she'll stand up and then step away slowly. Oh. Six-legged giraffe. Look at that. Good job, lady. Peter escapes harm, but no one knows if the baby has sustained any injuries. Wow. Just a few moments later, the baby's neck and shoulder. Whoa, whoa! There we go. Holy cow! Wild mother and baby would now be exceptionally vulnerable to predators. Yeah, lions would be spelling them from a long distance away, and maybe uh. One more push. Hyenas too. And gravity does the rest. Wow. Ugh. The miracle of birth. That's placental mammals for you. No egg laying for them. Lie motionless for several minutes. Yeah. Finally. Wow. Seems like an eternity. The baby stirs. Holy cow. It's a good sign that no bones were broken when Lady sat down. Yeah. But the calf will need to stand up and successfully nurse before Sherry and Kim can breathe a sigh of relief. Holy cow. Um. Yeah. Uh. Here, let's let's take take a look at this right here too for another baby giraffe. <laughs> A beautiful baby girl born here at Australia Zoo. There's a calf right there. Amazing. Oh, it's cute. Giraffe ultrasound. <laughs> wow. It's actually progressing quite quickly. So dinosaurs were not like this. As far as we know, all dinosaurs... Oh, there's another one. Oh. Sorry. Should have provided a warning there, but I didn't know this was going to happen. This is how placental mammals are born. No egg, just embryo, you know, <laughs> squirted out of the back. Hi, little one. Yeah. The Look at her. In her little giraffe life chapter, is meeting all of her other giraffe family members. It's a huge process going from their little area behind the scenes all the way outside. Wow. All right, so we're about to open up the door for Rose. So look, look at how fully formed this baby is. So this is a, this is really interesting because it, it kind of highlights like R versus K strategies and reproduction for vertebrate animals. Um, maybe I'll find you another video about this in just a minute, but uh, with like a K strategy and a K strategy like elephants, like whales, like giraffes, like humans, we typically have one baby at a time that's born fairly well developed, I guess, except in the case of humans. Our babies are basically like larvae. Um, they can't even walk or anything. But uh, but we invest a lot of parental care in them. So like the baby is born fairly well developed. A lot of, you know, physiological resources go into producing that baby. And then parents have to take care of it from the beginning. A K, uh, that's a K strategy. K strategy. R strategy. And I don't know why they gave them these letters, but the R strategy is basically like baby fishes or something. Where, like, the, the female fish just squirts out a bunch of eggs. The male squirts out a bunch of sperm. Then those two things meet, and then you've just got a million babies, and almost none of them survive. And there's, like, almost no parental care invested in them. They're just on their own. And it's, like, quantity over quality. For a case strategy, it's quality over quantity. Dinosaurs were interesting in that some of them kind of split the difference. Like, with dinosaurs like Myasaura, which laid a whole bunch of eggs. You know, maybe, like, 30 or 40 eggs, something like that. I'd have to look it up. But they also exhibited a certain degree of parental care. They actually cared for their eggs. They incubated them. They brought food back to the nest. They took care of their babies. So you've got quality and quantity with a lot of dinosaurs. It's interesting different reproductive strategies here. So yeah. Yeah. And are giraffes precocial? They kind of are, Freya Eloise. Yeah, precocial in that they can get up 
and run around the same day that they're born. They're not altricial. They don't have to stay in the nest or in the burrow. They're not born blind or anything like that. They can get up and run like the first day that they're born. Seeing a little yeah. And thank you, Hunter. I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, There's new smells and different noises. This is a different and new experience for our beautiful little calf. Huh. Good girl. It's okay. Look at her. We make sure that the little one is nice and comfortable out in the yard before we start introducing any other giraffe. <laughs> Dramatic music. Look, she's already running. Holy cow. She's, what, a day old or something? That's pretty excellent. I'm going to go blow my nose real quick. I'll be right back. Our little calf is obviously really enjoying meeting the rest of the herd. All of them have different personalities. Some are very nurturing. Others are a little bit more wary of a little calf. The lifting of the legs and stamping near them. So that's just letting the little one know that they've come a little bit too close to them. <laughs> anyway, very, very cool. And one week old? Okay, Oliver, yeah. Caravan says twice at the Memphis Zoo in 2017 and 2019. Uh, giraffe babies were born outside the enclosure, outside in the enclosure, with zoo visitors watching. Yeah. Wow. Good day to the rhinos and zebras and all of our Australian zoo zebras. Visitors. There's a lot left to come, but she's a very courageous little giraffe. Yeah. And I can't wait to meet her for the first time. I might just explode into glitter when I meet her with happiness. <laughs> yeah. And Claire Burses, are birds some of the only animals that aren't precocial? No, there's lots and lots of other altricial animals. Here, we'll see if uh, if I can find something for you there. Um, because there's lots of birds that are altricial and lots of birds that are precocial. Um... Here, let's let's take a look at this video right here. I think this will uh Yeah. Now Why are most some... kinds of babies are pretty cute. Oh. But when you compare a day old kitten to a day old deer, uh, there are some clear differences. The kitten yep. can't open its eyes while the deer can walk. Why do... So kittens and puppies they're born yeah, they're altricial. So they require a lot of parental care. They can't really do anything on their own when they're first born. They're helpless. So altricial means helpless. Precocial, it's the same root words as precocious. It means they can get up and go from very young age. Why did uh, humans are very altricial, Freya, so yes. Some animal babies yeah. that are almost totally helpless, while other animals have babies that walk, hop, or run just hours after birth. There are advantages and disadvantages to both reproductive strategies. Take hares and rabbits, for example. They're similar oh, yeah. animals, but baby rabbits are altricial, meaning they're born helpless and uh. have a ton of parental care. Their eyes are closed, they lack fur, and they can't regulate their own body temperature. Hair uh, I didn't know that. So hares and rabbits are actually pretty closely related, I think. Let's take a look. On our tree of life, um, let's go to Lagomorpha right here. Hares, pikas, and rabbits. So I, I, as, you know, an uncouth American, often think of hares and rabbits as being very similar. But maybe viewers from the UK or elsewhere would correct me on that. We've got rabbits and hares right here. Liporidae, 58 species. And rabbit, hare, hare, hare. Rabbit, rabbit. Rabbit, 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 cottontail, rabbit, rabbit, and hare. So, I, you know what? I take it back. I was right. Um, it does seem like hares and rabbits are... Those terms don't really mean very much. That's not two distinct groups. 
There's rabbits and hares in the same family. And some closely related species are... You've got species of rabbit that are closely related to species of hare. It's not like those are two separate groups. So I, I kind of take issue with this, I guess. But I guess some rabbits are born like this and some hares are precocial. A ton of parental care. Their eyes yeah. are closed, they lack fur, and they can't regulate their own body temperature. Hares, on the other hand, are precocial, meaning they're born more developed. I don't think that's true in all cases. Again, if we look at this, uh, for instance, right here... Um, yeah, we've got at least two species of rabbit, at least jackrabbits. Although maybe jackrabbits are, strictly speaking, a kind of hare. I don't know. Again, this is why we use scientific names when we're describing things as scientists. We don't use the common names. We don't say Alaskan hare versus snowshoe hare versus Granada hare. Like, no, these critters all have scientific names, you know? So that we'll get confused by, you know, different naming conventions from different languages, from different countries, from stuff like that. Instead, we just use, you know, uh, terms that are universal. They're scientific names, you know? Yeah, and drag rabbits are hares, says rat acid. Well, okay, okay. That would make sense. If this would be a monophyletic group, you can call these hares. Then, uh, you know what, let's look it up on Wikipedia, actually. Yeah. Uh, hares. Hares and jackrabbits are mammals belonging to the genus Lepus. Okay, so that's a monophyletic group. These are all members of the same genus. So again, this is why we use scientific names. It disambiguizes things. It makes things clearer. Yeah. Uh, their young are able to fend for themselves shortly after birth. Again, this is precocial. Versus altricial. Precociality versus altriciality. There is a link to this article. Interesting. Okay, okay. Video redeemed. Good stuff. Thank you for your input there, Rat Acid. Born helpless and yeah. They're similar animals, but baby rabbits are altricial, meaning they're born helpless and require a ton of parental care. Their eyes are closed, they lack fur, and they can't regulate their own body temperature. Here, Hairs, I'll be on right the back. Other hand, are precocial, meaning they're born more developed. Their newborns have fur and their eyes are open. These terms are typically applied to mammals and birds, where we can observe clear differences in the relative helplessness of their babies, like the kitten and the deer. Both groups are known for parental care as well. In altricial species in particular, parental care is a huge commitment. They spend a large amount of time investing in their offspring compared to parents of precocial species, things like preparing nests or caring for their babies. And animals that are more helpless at birth are extra vulnerable when they encounter a predator. But the parent also spends less time incubating the offspring before they're born and hatched. And as a result, altricial animals may be able to produce larger, more frequent litters. But while the parental investment required of these animals is enormous, it may also be relatively short-lived. Altricial birds, for example, require a lot of care in the beginning, but they mature more rapidly and become independent more quickly than precocial birds. Many precocial animals take longer to develop before birth, and parents usually give birth to only one or a few babies. That's there we go. Yeah. Pass on the parents' genes compared to altricial species, at least if those bigger litters survive. And some precocial babies, like certain species of bird, still receive food from their parents, even though they're yep. capable of leaving the nest on their own meaning they still need some parental care. But there are also and so, yeah. to being precocial. There's a lot of, like, in-betweens like this, too. It's definitely not a binary, and I don't want to give you that impression. These are not two opposite things, and there's nothing in between. There's a lot of gray areas in between here, too. Between precocial and altricial. So, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Anyway. Yeah... Buffalo and American bison and water buffalo, rabbits and jackrabbits and hares. There you go, Gimp. Like, those are common names. That's why the scientific names are the ones that we use in the sciences. So, yeah. And it is a spectrum. Exactly, Thraven. And Radisson says everything is a spectrum in nature. It, that's often the case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Zintao says, what's the range on the earbud, Danny? It's, uh, I don't know, probably about... 30 feet Zentaus, but it's significantly extended because I have a, a Bluetooth transmitter plugged into my computer. So, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. An upstairs down since I knew Latin classes would come in useful one day. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we got into this by, uh, by talking about this tweet from Kerry Woodruff, a sauropod researcher. He was pointing out this new paper about the study of the changes in a giraffe's neck as it grows and matures and how interesting how there are several changes. The giraffe juvenile has different proportions to the head and neck from the adult. The head just about doubles in size from the juvenile to adult, whereas the neck increases almost 4.5 times, roughly four times in length. Ontogeny. Yeah, changes in ontogeny. Exactly, Tommy Platicus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the giraffe juvenile vertebrae are shorter and do not have, uh, and do not have, and they do not have fused the cranial epiphyseal plates. I guess not, uh, not native English speakers, maybe. It's authors. <laughs> uh, but English has become the lingua franca of the modern sciences, so yeah. Uh, and the ventral tubercles are underdeveloped. So this is the thing. This is really, really interesting because there are all of these different dinosaurs that have been named different sauropods, different long-necked plant-eating dinosaurs that have been named on the virtue of, of just a few neck vertebrae. Um... Yeah. So, let's see. If we just look at a list of South American dinosaurs, I bet you the majority of these are going to be different sauropods from Argentina. Uh, yep. Argentine sauropod, Argentine... Oh, no, Brazilian sauropod. Argentine sauropod, Argentine sauropod. Uh, Argentine sauropod. Argentine sauropod, Argentine sauropod, Argentine... Oh, Brazilian sauropod. Argentine sauropod. Argentine sauropod. Argentine sauropod. So many different Argentine sauropods. And many of them are named on the basis of just, like, a single vertebra. Or even just a couple of vertebrae like this. And if the vertebrae are actually changing a lot as the animals are growing and maturing... It's gonna turn out that a lot of these different sauropods are actually the same thing. They're just different growth stages of the same animals. And the better we understand sauropod vertebral ontogeny, the better handle we can get on sauropod diversity. So this paper, I think, is going to prove to be really important, and I'm really glad that Carrie shouted this out. And again, here is the link to that. I'll give you the link to this one right here. Yeah. But yeah, there you go. They're all growing up to be Argentinosaurus. I mean, a lot of them are from different times and slightly different places, Mayor of Space. So, no, but I'm, I bet you there are at least, there are going to be several different Argentine sauropods that turn out to be the same thing as Argentinosaurus. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, like Jack Horner's TED, Jack Horner's TED Talk. Exactly, Tommy Platicus. Yeah. Yeah. And upstairs down says, I adore Twitch and YouTube for the incredible free ed education. Never stop learning. There you go, upstairs down. And you're off to the Jurassic Coast in June. Very cool. I wish you many epic ammonites, upstairs down. Even if you don't find many epic ammonites, just... You're so lucky to be able to drink in that history there on the Jurassic Coast of southern England. That's super, super neat. So, yeah. Yeah. See if you can go see the uh, the Mary Anning statue at Lyme Regis. Uh, there we go. Here, I'll see if I can find a video. Uh, there we go. Mary Anning, 
the mother of paleontology. Now has a statue at Lyme Regis. She was not recognized properly during her lifetime. She ended up dying in poverty despite making incredible contributions to the field of paleontology. Yeah. We'll be having a special celebration for the birthday of Mary Anning next month here on Paleontologizing. And you were there? That's super cool, Triple Helix. That's super cool. Yeah. Huge paleontologizing salute to Mary Anning. Uh, they should have made the statue out of ammonites. No, Mayor Space. <laughs> there are a bunch of ammonites in the statue, though. But they're bronze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Clipper says, now I want to see Julianne Moore cosplay as Mary. I mean, you can see Kate Winslet portray Mary Anning in the film Ammonite that came out a few years ago, which I would recommend if you're a fan of, of period dramas. And, uh... Yeah, it's kind of a bleak film. Mary Anning led kind of a bleak life. But, uh... Yeah... Here we go. Let's see if I can find you a real quick trailer here. Um, let's try this. Yeah. It was a sea lizard. It's Quite a spicy. It, I, yeah, not the brain. I would agree. Take it out. Clean it. I was only 11 years old. It's in the British Museum. That one was special. Yeah. Miss Anning. I've often heard your reputation discussed in the Geographical Society in London. Is there something you wanted, sir? My wife. She hasn't been at all well of late. She suffers from melancholia. I want her to walk the shoreline with you, learn from you. So it's much more of a of a romance film than it is like a scientific biography. Easy work. But I would I'd recommend it if that sounds interesting to you. Yeah. Don't like the water. What is it? Yeah. Cheap tourist fodder. And uh, Mr. Knight, the IT guy, says the film was not true to her actual life. Would you like to elaborate? I mean, yeah. Are you an expert in Mary Anning, Mr. Knight? <laughs> so Mary Anning, we know that she associated with, um, oh, shoot, what was her name? Uh, we know that they definitely had a very close friendship. We know that Mary Anning never married. She was never interested in marrying. She was something of an iconoclast during her time. Um... So yeah, yeah. And you know who she was? Well, inform us then. Tell us about her. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Pendrake says, who's the other gal in the trailer? Do you mean the actor's name or the character's name? Here. Um... Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the film centers on a speculative romantic relationship between Mary Anning and Charlotte Murchison. Played by... And what is her... How do you say her name? I want to say it's... Uh, Sir... Shirsa? Shirsa Ronan? Yeah... Uh, da, 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 da. 
Critical response. Historical accuracy. Yeah, the film's historical accuracy has been questioned. You'll hear the same thing about, uh, about Annie Montague Alexander, though. You know? Yeah. Anyway. Two of Anning's distant relatives were reported to have had differing views on the decision to depict her as a lesbian, with Lorraine Anning supporting the film, but Barbara Anning criticizing the choice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I will give you a link to this article if you'd like to read more about it. But, yeah. Yeah. Um. And, Mr. Knight, we don't know if it's true or not. That's the thing, and that's kind of what the film is about. Have you seen it, by the way? Um, but yeah, yeah. Completely unrecognized, well, almost completely unrecognized at the time. Only in our modern age is Mary Anning really getting some of the recognition that she so thoroughly deserves. Many of her observations about some of these fossil creatures completely unrecognized during her day. In fact, the people who, uh, the wealthy gentleman who purchased fossils from her often published her observations and claimed that those observations, you know, were their own. Like, oh yes, I found this fossil myself at Lyme Regis, and here are my scientific observations of this. You know, yeah, because she was A, a woman, and B working class she was taken advantage of by men of high standing at the time so anyway yeah um anywho yeah and Mr. Knight I mean have you seen the film Mr. Knight tell me that have, have you seen the film um because, yeah. She... It's only recently that she's become any kind of icon at all. You know? Yeah, you have seen the film. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I don't know. I like to think that this is a... A pretty decent tribute to the life of Mary Anning. It doesn't... Of course, as a paleontologist, I would love for the whole film to have been about her science and her scientific legacy. But when you're talking about an art house film, that's not really the sort of thing that they're going to be producing. You know? So I can kind of understand they're playing up the romantic angle on this. And it's an interesting take on her life, but I think it's done very respectfully, and I personally am not at all threatened by that, you know? So there you go. I enjoyed it. It was a bleak, but beautiful film. And I think it's a lovely tribute to the life and times of Mariana. But yeah, yeah. Um, are there any documentaries about her, too? Not enough. Mary Anning tends to play kind of bit parts in different documentaries. I I know of at least one short film that kind of focuses on her. And we'll talk all about Mary Anning on her birthday. May 21st. Uh, which is... Let's see. I haven't put this on my calendar yet. But, uh, that's a Friday. Beautiful. Yeah, on Friday, May 21st, we're going to be having an extra special stream to celebrate the birthday of Mary Anning and celebrate her legacy. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. And Mr. Knight says, in the UK, she's very well known. I mean, almost everybody I've talked to from the UK who's not already interested in paleontology has never heard of Mary Anning. So I don't think she's well-known enough. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And I've never been to Lyme. I've never been to the UK, Mr. Knight. No. No. Um. Yeah. Uh. 
And children learn about her in KS2, so 8 to 11 year olds. That is really good to hear. I'm glad to hear that upstairs then. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just kind of fed up with people trying to downplay the contributions of Mary Anning. Because I hear that even among people today, like, oh, Mary Anning, just more of this, like, you know, women's live LGBTQ propaganda, rah, 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 and I'm so sick and tired of hearing that. Like, I don't know. I've even heard that from researchers in paleontology, believe it or not. Like, just a couple of years ago. Um, you get a few drinks into some people and you'd be amazed at what they say. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's very true, but true. Anyway, let's continue on with this. Uh, where were we? Are talking about giraffe ontogeny and that kind of thing? Yeah, well, let's see here. Get rid of these tabs right here. And, uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. We were going to talk very, very briefly about a new species and genus of Pachycephalosaur, which I was shocked to hear about that. Just published today. We'll be talking about this extensively tomorrow. As soon as I saw the headline for this, a new Pachycephalosaurid from the Hell Creek Formation? Garfield County, Montana. I have myself have done a tremendous amount of field work. Not tremendous amount. <clears throat> Sorry. I've done... Let's see. Six years worth of field work. Or six summers worth of field work in the Hell Creek. Um, latest Cretaceous... Uh, of eastern Montana, in Garfield County, in Valley County, in Macon County. Yeah. And I've dug up a couple of pachycephalosaurs there, too. Hearing that there is a new pachycephalosaurid being proposed, instantly made me a little skeptical until I saw the author's list. Which, I think you'll see why once we talk about this kind of assuaged my fears a little bit. Uh, Jack Horner, my old boss, Mark Goodwin of Berkeley, just saw him yet uh, Tuesday, and Dave Evans from up in Canada. So Jack Horner and Mark Goodwin are responsible for sinking several pachycephalosaur taxa from the Hell Creek Formation through ontogeny. And yet here... They propose an entirely new taxon, Platytholus clemensi. And holy cow, that must be named after Bill Clemens. Who, uh, who, who passed away in, uh, in November of 2021, I believe. But yeah. Anyway, I'm going to be reading the paper here. It's in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, which means I have access to this. I'll download the paper, I'll read through it, and we'll be talking about this extensively on Monday. So get ready for that. Should be a lot of fun. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And Jody Fish says the 15th is listed as no stream. That's not right. Let me see if, uh, do I have that? Uh... Let's see. Monday's the 17th. There we go. Um, and Hell Creek Paleo Ecology. There we go. Yeah. Uh, but later on next week, I'm going to be gone on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 
Then I'll be coming back Friday and having a special stream on Saturday, the 22nd. And who knows, maybe even Sunday the 23rd, but no promises on that. So yeah, yeah. Uh... I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Thank you. Well, holy cow, Science Streams. I appreciate you more than you know, Science Streams. Holy cow. Thank you, thank you. That is extraordinary. A tier three sub from Science Streams, which makes Science Streams one of the very few chatters who can do this in chat. Yeah, and that is almost a whole year, isn't it, Claire Burr? 24 months. Holy cow. Yeah. And Mr. Knight says, so glad I found this channel. I'm so glad you're here too, Mr. Knight. Holy cow. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about this. And, uh... Shoot, if I'd known this was coming out, I would have asked Mark about it on Tuesday. And thank you, Matt. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Matt M33, for your generosity. Thank you for that support. That's, uh... That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> Uh, we're at 9 out of 50 here for our sub goal for the day. Beautiful. Yeah. And TNT... Has TNT taken off? Great time zone. What do you mean, Claire? Oh, just saying hi. Oh, okay. Gotcha. TNT Gunblow, it's great to have you here, too. Um, and th thank you again, Matt. I'm 33. I really appreciate you. That Founders badge looks really good next to your name, by the way. Very sharp. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. You're here for the long haul? Welcome. Well, that's great, TNT. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Anyway, very excited to talk about this. I, uh. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I'll have to read this paper tonight. Um. Exciting stuff. It's. All the years that I was doing field work in the Hell Creek, I always told myself, like, you know, you're so lucky to be able to do this, to be able to work in some of the the most well-known strata, dinosaur-wise, anywhere in the world. But you know you're not going to find any new species there. Holy cow, we've got a new genus and new species from the Hell Creek. It's bringing the total number of dinosaur species higher for the Hell Creek, which is really interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for the hydrate there, Kirsten Games. Cheers. Yeah. Ah! Good stuff. So yeah, we will be talking about that on Monday. Don't miss it. Especially since that's going to be my last stream until next Friday. I'm taking three days off next week to do some science and get some fresh air and all that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. But we've got a few other pieces of information to take a look at. In fact, I think this would be neat to see. We've got a brand new video from PBS Eons, and I have been increasingly impressed with their videos lately. So let's take a look at this, We're talking about the KPG extinction. The extinction that took from us the dinosaurs, except for birds and the plesiosaurs, and the mosasaurs, and the giant marine turtles, and the, you know, uh, the ammonites, and so many other 90% of mammal species at the time, 90% of birds, 20% of turtles, 20% of crocodilians, something like that, etc., etc. But this was the extinction event that also paved the way for us mammals to eventually evolve into, you know, us. So it's important to talk about. It was the end of an era. This is like kind of the beginning. The beginning of the modern era, literally speaking. The beginning of the Cenozoic. Uh, the KPG extinction. This video is entitled, How Some, in parentheses, Some Plants Survived the KPG Extinction. Let's take a look. It's cold and dark. Ash and dust cloud the air, blocking out the sun and you're stuck with nowhere to go. You can't run or hide or burrow deep underground. 
But you also can't just do nothing. You're a living organism and survival is the name of the game. Mm. So what happens to you? This was the challenge plants faced in the wake of the asteroid impact that ended the reign of dinosaurs some 66 million years ago. At the because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Jenny, thank you for the Prime sub. I really appreciate that, Jenny. Thank you, thank you. I know you only get one of those Prime subs per month. Thank you for spending it here. I appreciate that, Jenny. Thank you, thank you for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. Appreciate you. The end of the Cretaceous yeah. period. And many of them didn't make it. Roughly 60% of all plant species went extinct. Yeah. But the ancestors of plants we know today and Keeper67, thank you for the gift sub there. That is good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Keeper. If we manage to get to a level 5 hype train, I will play some ukulele songs about science live on air. So we'll see if we get there. Hey, plant Here. species went extinct. But yeah, the ancestors shoot. of plants we know today did survive. So how'd they do it? Well, for some of them, at least part of the answer may be hidden in their genomes. It's the legacy of a particular kind of mutation event. I hate a mosaic too. Thanks, Jenny. only pay off Appreciate in times it. of extreme environmental stress. And it affected many different plant lineages almost simultaneously, from the forebearers of potatoes to lotuses to legumes. It looks oh. like these ancient survivors doubled their DNA. Probably literally, they probably had a DNA duplication event. Because uh, apparently plants do this all the time, and it just works for them. Um, but yeah, yeah. This might have to do with the uh, the plant that we were talking about just the other day that survived the KPG boundary. Uh, the ancestor of potatoes and coffee and stuff like that, I think it was. Yeah. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. And thank you, Mr. Knight. Hey. Up to an eccentric meanie. I appreciate that, Mr. Knight. Thank you, thank you very, very much for the gifts up there. Holy cow. Thank you kindly. That's excellent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Appreciate you. Today, angiosperms, or flowering plants, are the largest and most diverse group of plants on the planet. They represent nearly 90% of all living plant species. They first appeared in the fossil record maybe as early as the mid-Jurassic period and rapidly radiated into all kinds of environments by the early Cretaceous. Yep. And they're the foundation <clears throat> of most terrestrial ecosystems today. Angiosperms are dominant to today. To our farms, yeah. which grow mostly angiosperm crops. Our world just... In fact, I once uh, posed this question to some, to some paleobotanists where I said... What are some gymnosperm plants that provide food to us today? Gymnosperms, non-flowering plants. In fact, I feel like I could pose that as a question to you. What are some non-flowering plants that provide us with food today, chat? Smay has already got maybe the only correct answer. <laughs> Smay. Um, quick on the draw there. Holy cow, Smay. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in talking about here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's see here. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Here are some bits to help with continuing the outreach. Thank you, Kirsten Games. I appreciate those hundred bits. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you kindly. Yeah. To our farms, which grow mostly angiosperm crops. Like almost entirely angiosperm crops. Um, yeah. So pine nuts. You know, angiosperms. By the way, let, let's look them up on the Tree of Life. Uh. There we go. Uh... I think you should enjoy science as much as you can. And you can't enjoy science alone. You have to share it. Thank you, Dino Wolf, for the three months of Prime support. Thank you, thank you, Dino Wolf. Appreciate you. 
Thank you very much. Good stuff. Now, I'm... I'm trying to find this on the Tree of Life, but Angiospermus isn't popping up. Angiosperma? Yeah. Flowering plant. Uh, so what's the actual clade name? Uh, Magnolia Phyta... Spermatophytes, maybe? Let's try Spermatophytes. Uh... That's not showing up either. Ugh. Um... Basal angiosperms. Well, shoot. Let's just look up Magnolia. Because they're pretty basal. Magnoliaceae. There we go. So just about any plant that we today get food from will be a member of this larger group. Which, let's see, there's flowers there. Flowering plants. Magnoliopsida. Okay. With 366,701 extant species. Just about any food, any plant that gives us food today, you can trace back to this group. With the exception of things like pine nuts, which come from conifers, which are not flowering plants. And also, well, that's, that's almost it. Yeah. Whether you're talking about potatoes, or carrots, or coffee, or chocolate, or rutabagas, or eggplant, or asparagus, or mangoes, or apples, or whatever. Those are all flowering plants. Also, beans, and squash, and corn, and celery, and just about everything you can think of, you know? So yeah, yeah. There are very few gymnosperms that actually anybody eats. Uh, very few non-flowering plants. However, uh, apparently, uh, oh, Cycadioidea is not coming up? Let's look up Cycas, I guess. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Down there, the cycads are not flowering plants. And, uh... That's weird. Does this not have genus Zamia or, uh... Or Lepidozamia or Encephalarctos? What's up with this cladogram? What's up with this cladogram? What? Macrozamia. What are these? These might be really out of date. I'm not familiar with these genera. Either I'm out of date or this is out of date. But anywho. Yeah. I wish we had Diagonal here. Diagonal would know about that. But yeah. Yeah. And what about seaweed? Seaweed is also a flowering plant, I think, Majot. But let's, let's take a look at that. Um... Seaweed might also be a non-monophyletic group. So seaweeds, I think, are angiosperms. But let's see. Uh, maybe not, actually. Seaweeds. Yeah. That, oh, you know what? That might be an excellent one there, yeah. Because I think some seaweeds are actually not even plants at all. They're like protists or something like that. So that... Yeah. A seaweed and angiosperm. So sea grasses are like... Like they're shown in our flowering plants called angiosperms. Um, but seaweed... is Some of them are not even plants. Yeah. 
They refer to thousands of species of macroscopic multicellular marine algae. So they wouldn't even technically be plants, I guess. Um, it's an informal group of macroscopic marine algae. Wild. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Knight says seaweed is supposed to stop cows farting. <laughs> and burping, too. Apparently burping is a bigger problem than farting for cows. Expelling all that methane. But yeah. Oh, Dr. Terra, this is super cool. Yeah, angiosperm leaves. We were talking about this yesterday. Uh, very briefly. Baharia fossils. Uh, these are from Egypt. I think Cenomanian in age. Late, uh, like, middle Cretaceous. Very cool stuff. That's super neat. Oh, this is really, really cool. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Monocots, magnolias, loralis, magnoliaceids, proteales. Very, very neat. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. And are algae in the animal kingdom? No. They're outside of Animalia, Pendrick. Yeah. Anyway, apparently there are some people who, uh, let's see, who eat cycad seeds. Yeah. There we go. Cooking with poison in Japan. In part of Japan lives a highly toxic plant called the cycad. And yeah. Not, people consume it regularly. Beloved and cherished by the native people of Amami Oshima, eating the plant in its raw form could kill you. Yep. This is pretty nuts. Uh. Amami Oshima is home to hundreds of types of toxic plants. The cycad has been a staple crop on the island. So this looks like Cycas revoluta, which is sometimes known as the Sago cycad or the Sago palm. It's not a palm at all. It's far more ancient than palms. Palms, I think, are actually... Palms are flowering plants, aren't they? Aren't they angiosperms? Island for generations. Anyway. Yeah. Because it is so poisonous, locals take the necessary steps to make the plants safe for human consumption. This is pretty interesting. ものすごく長い歴史があるんです。水もいらない。非常に失速生えている。というのかね。貯めるとその毒がやっぱり体内に入ると、あの、効いてくるというね。Man, <笑> people eat the craziest stuff. Imagine that trial and error here. Whereby their ancestors found a way to eat to take the poison out of the cycad. People gave their lives to figure out how to eat this ancient plant. This this ancient lineage of plants that lived alongside the dinosaurs, you know? It's it's pretty wild. And these are not potatoes, Red Bulwark. These are the seeds of cycads. Uh, cycads are this group of plants. Uh, that actually predate the dinosaurs. I think they go back to the the Permian period, or maybe even earlier. Today, they're very rare. There's only like 200 species in the world of cycads. But they used to be fairly dominant on planet Earth. They were all over the place. And, uh... Yeah. It's been speculated that this may have been the favorite food of stegosaurs. Like in, uh, in this lovely, very speculative, but beautiful book, In the Presence of Dinosaurs, by uh, Larry Felder and John Calagranda. Yeah, lovely art in this book. Um, this is basically like, I'm kind of, I wish more people knew about this book. It's one of my favorites, honestly. It's like, you know, how walking with dinosaurs or prehistoric planet, uh, they're kind of like nature documentary style programs about extinct creatures. 
They're speculative, but they're based in real science. This is like that in book form right here. So in this, you've got stegosaurs with their throat armor right there. Using that to eat those fleshy fruits from cycads. The caption says stegosaurs are particular, particularly fond of cycad fruit. The pebbled armor that lines the animal's throat region is an effective protection against the sharp, spiny cycad leaves that would otherwise stand between the stegosaur and its favorite food. So yeah, cycads. Uh, pretty cool plants. Pretty cool plants. And it is an interesting hypothesis, Charlie's Dragon. It's one that I actually might like to test at some point in the next couple years. So yeah. Yeah. And uh, WM Steadbot, I've heard of this, yeah, yeah. So the green wavelength is one that uh, is reflected by chlorophyll. Yeah. All other wavelengths are absorbed and converted. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. So here's people taking cycad seeds and the fleshy fruits from them. A staple crop on the island for generations. Yeah. Because it is so poisonous, locals take the necessary steps to make the plants safe for human consumption. That's pretty wild. It really is. Yeah. That's nuts. Wow. But you do what you gotta do, you know? So how do they uh, the detoxify them? The poison is extracted from the plant. Do they concentrate the poison afterward? Oh, that's crazy, really? Oh, wow. I want to try this. Do they have to cut them down though? They're so slow growing. Oh, oh it hurts my heart. That was probably like a hundred years old. Oh my goodness. So I'm growing several cycads in my little indoor garden right now. I've just got a, a shelf with a couple of cycad plants on it. And they've not grown, they maybe grow like a centimeter a year or something like that. Um, yeah. I guess they've got enough of them, though, where they can do this. Yeah. Yeah. And Lenina says, I often forget I've got a cycad tattooed on me. You do, Lenina. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> uh, it's a tale as old as time. Holy cow. It's like Ireland with the potatoes, you know? Uh, where they, they had to basically give all the good food to their, you know, the people oppressing them. And they're left with... They have to, to find ingenious solutions to get enough calories to survive. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, oh, thank you, Mr. Knight. Hey, I appreciate you. You sleep well, and I'll see you next time, I hope. I'll see you on maybe Monday. See you around, Mr. Knight. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that gift sub earlier, too. Appreciate you very much. Yeah. <laughs> ある程度米が
、褒めるべき、称えるべき植物だと思ってます。<笑>私はこうして考えてるから大事にしてるんですけどね。文化として引き継ぎたい。そのことが私の生きがいなんです。生きがいにつながるんです。That's beautiful. I love that. So that is a very rare example of a non flowering plant, the cycad, that people eat. It's crazy because most plants that people eat are flowering plants, angiosperms. And the big, holy cow. So flowering plants first, first evolved during the early Cretaceous period, as far as we can tell. About halfway through the age of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were present for the birth of flowers and probably had some influence on the evolution of early flowering plants, too. Probably. But it was the asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous period, 66 million years ago, that really cemented the domination of angiosperms. This is one of those sea changes in the history of life. This is one of the events that paved the way for our modern world, including us, 66 million years ago. So let's take a look. By the early Cretaceous. Yeah. The foundation of most terrestrial ecosystems today, from、yep. rainforests to meadows to our farms, which grow mostly angiosperm crops. Our、yep. world just wouldn't be the same without them. And many aspects of their remarkable evolutionary success h a s been pretty mysterious for a long time. But over the last 20 or so years that we've been digging into their genomes, scientists have found a strange pattern that might be an important piece of the puzzle. Angiosperms have experienced many instances of whole genome duplication in their、Ooh. evolutionary history. Which、like、is、lungfish. exactly what it sounds like. Ancient events、yeah. where their ancestors duplicated all of their DNA. Now,、Holy、these、cow. events are pretty dramatic and sudden. And yeah, it's like, hey, we've got these genes, and now we're going to double them. You know? Double or nothing. And they chose double.、Um, <laughs> so instantly, your whole genetic code gets twice as long. This is something that, that flying animals don't do. Birds don't do this. Bats don't do this. Pterosaurs wouldn't have done this. Flying insects don't do this because it does make your, your. I've been told that it makes your nucleus much heavier. So every single cell in your body will be heavier and you'll just be heavier overall. But if you're a plant, who cares? You don't have to fly. You don't even have to move. You, have to, you just have to stay put. So yeah. Red Bulwark says, doesn't that lead to bigger or more severe mutations? I'm not sure, Red Bulwark. Maybe it does. I don't know. I'm not a geneticist. Somebody like,、uh, like Belint or Lita from Science Streams would be much more apt to answer that question. Maybe we can ask them if we raid in later tonight. We'll see. And they happen totally、yeah. by accident. See, errors in the process of meiosis, which generates reproductive cells, end up leaving them with twice as much DNA as they should have. Then, when they、okay. fertilize other reproductive cells with double DNA, the offspring is what's called a polyploid, an individual、uh... with extra copies of its genome. And wherever we look in the angiosperm family tree, we see that living species come from polyploid ancestors that experienced multiple whole genome duplications in deep time. And this、uh. is way more common in angiosperms than any other group. Some Rat Acid said if,、uh, if a set of your DNA gets damaged, you're likely to have a good set left. So it would be almost like an insurance policy against,、uh, uh, against you know, harmful mutations or something like that,、uh, or cancers or something. Is that right, Rat Acid? Possibly. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Charlie's Dragon says, as long as there's not a lot of mutations in the duplication, you'll always have an extra set to combat mutations, which would make you more kind of conservative in terms of evolution. You're not going to be, you know, generating lots of mutations left and right and evolving very quickly. Maybe. Again, I work on dinosaurs here. So,、uh, Horizontal gene transfer that you get in various plants and like all kinds of other shenanigans like that. I don't know the first thing about because I don't work on plants. So,、uh, yeah, anyway, it's interesting stuff.
Interesting. Some lineages have even had up to six duplication events. Holy now, cow. Now, this is a bit of a conundrum because many biologists thought that polyploidy should generally be an evolutionary dead end. Organisms huh. shouldn't just be able to copy their genomes all willy-nilly like, and it often leaves plants with issues that make them a worse fit for their niche. So hmm. in theory at least, polyploids should be weeded out by natural selection over time, except these weren't. Instead, they seem to have been rampant across flowering plant evolution. And in hmm. 2009... I wonder if this is just sort of the luck of the draw, though. If you had duplication events, uh, like genome duplication events right before the KPG boundary. The asteroid hits and it... Look at this graph. Did you see that graph, everybody? Holy cow. Terrier terror. Thanks for showing us that graph and thank you for the follow. Welcome to paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. <laughs> um, uh, you looked at it good stuff right red bulwark yeah um <clears throat> uh what was i saying yeah i wonder if this is a luck of the draw kind of thing where you just had some duplication events and those groups happened to survive the kpg boundary they were the lucky survivors and now kapow they're everywhere you know like, they were able to survive so well because there was no competition after the boundary. I don't know. Researchers comparing plant genomes noticed that the timing of these whole genome duplication events didn't seem to be purely random. Really? They found a wave of them. There you go. I think this is the bottleneck right here. It's like some of those plants survived and then you had some gene duplication events. And it's because they had so little competition afterward that, like, even those... You know, normally those uh, gene duplication events would have been, excuse me, those genome duplication events may have been fatal uh, if you had lots of competition. But when all of your competitors are dead from an asteroid, suddenly you've got free reign. Suddenly, the world's your oyster and you can expand and take over the planet after that. That may be what happened here across angiosperms all dating to around Here. 60 across flowering plant evolution and in 2009 researchers comparing plant genomes noticed that the timing of these whole genome duplication events didn't seem to be purely random they okay. found a wave of them across angiosperms all dating to around 66 million years ago there you go at the end of the cretaceous period makes Was sense just a coincidence or could it be that individuals with double their usual DNA had a survival advantage during this time? Or they may have gotten sort of lucky too. I don't know. Let's let's see. While polyploidy usually comes with a bunch of problems in the right environmental context, there are also reasons to think it might be an evolutionary shortcut to success. That's because huh. doubling the genome also creates a lot of adaptability and evolutionary opportunity. Natural mm. selection suddenly has all that extra genetic raw material to innovate with. It can repurpose redundant extra copies of genes and genetic pathways for entirely new roles, or use them to rewire existing pathways, changing how they work. Huh. Evolution is, after all, a legacy system. It works with what it's got, tweaking existing features rather than creating brand new features from scratch. True. So Very true. So having twice the genome to play with can allow rapid adaptation in ways that weren't possible before. Yeah, uh, double the genome, double the evolutionary fun there. That's, uh... <laughs> Interesting. Um... I do wonder whether this actually was a distinct advantage that polyploidy would have or whether this was just kind of luck in certain circumstances where it's like these are things that would not be advantages except for the dire straits that Earth was in at the time. But yeah, yeah. Um, and Rat Acid says that massive asteroid impact really shocked the planet. I mean... <laughs> Oh, I'm sure things were fine, Rat Acid.
Polyploids uh. are less fit compared to non-polyploids when conditions are stable and the name of the game is being fine-tuned to fit a specific niche. Okay. But in times of environmental upheaval, like say the aftermath of a global mass extinction, they can tolerate a broader range of conditions. And so suddenly they have an advantage. Beautiful. And we have modern evidence that supports this idea too. Polyploidy seems to be especially common today in invasive plant species. Really? And those that live in stressful and unstable environments. Huh. It seems to help them find their ecological footing. Could the same process have been behind the ancient wave of whole genes? So to me, it's like, uh, it's like I'm a little skeptical of this because I don't understand plant genetics enough. I don't understand plants enough to really feel like I have any kind of grasp over this. And so this almost seems too perfect. Kind of funny. I mean, you know. <laughs> they are kind of funny. And uh, Pinyiko, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. Um, yeah, shoot. Like this, this almost seems like too perfect, perfect of an explanation. Like I'm, I'm in instinctively a little bit skeptical of it. It's like, shoot, I don't know anything about plants. I don't know. I'd love to hear the the perspectives of of some paleobotanists on this. Um. Yeah, and no, that was not a Jurassic Park reference to everybody wondering about that. I'd love to get the perspective of a a paleobotanist also. <laughs> no, I want to hear some people who work on fossil plants. Um, talk about this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Let her explain more. I will, Pendrake. Let's go back a touch. And those that live in stressful and unstable environments, it seems to help them find their ecological footing. Could huh. the same process have been behind the ancient wave of whole genome duplications? It makes sense. Sperms right around the end Cretaceous mass Seems extinction? to make sense. And if so, what kind of advantages could it have offered to help them withstand the cataclysm and adapt to the post-apocalyptic conditions? Hmm. Well, in 2019, researchers in China published a new study claiming to have found some answers to those questions. They compared the genomes of 23 living species from across the angiosperm family tree, including okay. corn, rice, and bananas. Using hmm. that data, they Delicious. searched for duplicated genes in each lineage that could be traced back to around 66 million years ago. So yeah, this is the KPG boundary right here, the extinction event that drove the extinction of... Uh... Hang on. Uh, of dinosaurs and uh, all these other groups. Dinosaurs except for birds. Um, by the way, this is a lovely visual, visual representation of the age of mammals compared to the age of dinosaurs. Up here, age of mammals. Right here. Age of dinosaurs. So much longer. Just the Cretaceous period. Out of the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, just the Cretaceous is longer than the entire age of mammals. So uh, think about that the next time you're thinking about, um, I, I don't know, uh, dinosaurs versus mammals. So mammals and dinosaurs birth, both first evolve around the same time here in like the middle Triassic. Um and then uh, mammals stay super small for about 170 million years. And then, bow, 66 million years ago, all the dinosaurs except for birds go extinct, and suddenly that's the big break for mammals. But for the majority of mammals' time here on our planet Earth, they were super small and shrew-like. So, yeah. Plant, uh, flowering plants first evolve right about here, about halfway through the age of mammals in, like, the early Cretaceous. And then uh, they're doing pretty well. They're kind of increasingly becoming more important in their ecosystems. Flowering plants are until right here. Bow! Suddenly, a bunch of their uh, their contemporaries get wiped out by that asteroid. And suddenly, flowering plants, they're, they've they got it made after this. And grasses evolve, and they, they just take over the planet during the Cenozoic alongside the mammals. You know, mammals and flowering plants, it's... You know, it's it's a match made in heaven there. Um, yeah, yeah. So anyway. Oh, yeah, and we might be a blink between the ages, says Christius. I mean, humans don't evolve until, like, the last pixel right here, basically. 
um, right there, like just a few hundred thousand years before present. So like that, that's a couple of pixels right there, maybe if that, maybe less than a quarter pixel or something. Um, yeah. Anywho, really, really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. And Rat Acid says, yeah, Earth 100 million years ago would would have looked nothing like today. Well, that's the thing is that in the grand scheme of things, 100 million years ago, which would be here in the, you know, the early to middle Cretaceous, um, that's not, it's not like it would look nothing like today. Because in the grand scheme of things, that's not even that long ago. Let me blow your mind for a second here. Um, let's see. Geologic time. Spiral. There we go. Tools. Size. A large. There we go. I excuse the very outdated illustrations of ancient creatures or you've got a like swamp bound sauropod dragging its tail a stegosaur dragging its tail this is like a direct copy of the uh, of the Sinclair Dino Land stegosaurus by the way I find that really funny the stegosaurus right here anyway but what this does provide is some context so when we're talking about our place in time as human beings. You know, we show up here. Or, no, actually, we show up around the beginning of the... Pl well, no. We show up in the Pleistocene e epoch right here. Man, this is out of date. But still, it. what we're getting here is a sense of scale. Uh, so human beings, depending on who you ask depending on what you consider one of the first humans, were either just under a million years old or just over 100,000 years old, which is literally the blink of an eye in geologic time. Literally, figuratively, whatever. It is figuratively the blink of an eye. Uh, and even this is not really... Yeah... Pliocene, Pleistocene, uh, Pleistocene, Pliocene, Miocene, Oligocene, Eocene. This is not even really to scale here. But, you know, the Mesozoic era, the age of dinosaurs up here, that's still very recent in Earth history. Like, you can follow this spiral all the way back to the dawn of life about three and a half billion years ago, which is way down here. And then you got to go another billion years before you get to the formation of the Earth. About 4.54 billion with a B years ago. So in the grand scheme of things, just 100 million years ago, back in the Cretaceous, not that different from today. We still had flowering plants. Flowers were still around 100 million years ago. They were kind of getting their start, but they were here. You had dinosaurs running around doing their thing. The atmosphere would have been pretty similar to today. Similar levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide and stuff like that. I hasten to point that out because a lot of people seem to think, oh yeah, during the age of dinosaurs, there was like 10 times more oxygen, right? That's why dinosaurs got so big. No. No. <laughs> um, as far as we can tell, oxygen levels were about the same, if not lower during the age of dinosaurs. So yeah. Yeah. But 99% of all plants and animals were completely foreign. But that's true for any time in Earth history, right? Acid, yeah. I mean, the further you go back, go back in time, the more weird things get, I guess. So 100 million years ago, things are 100 million years weirder. But 200 million years ago, holy cow, things are 200 million years weirder. And et cetera, and et cetera. So yeah, if you were to... Uh, to travel back in time to a hundred million years ago. Um, then our Earth would look something like... Something like this. This is a hundred five million years ago. This is what our Earth looked like at the time. 
North America, Europe, Asia, uh, Australia is still down here kind of kissing Antarctica. There's India right there, still stuck to Madagascar. They just broke off from Africa a little while ago. There's South America. Yeah, yeah. So things look different, but they're not... They're not, like... You know, it, it's not like on Star Trek where they go to some distant planet and it's like completely alien atmosphere. It's not like, you're not dealing with Spaceman Spiff kind of stuff. You know? Uh, it's not a... You know, totally alien planet like this. It's still our own Earth, just a hundred million years in the past. You've still got the ancestors of modern plants, modern mammals, modern birds... Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it's not, it's not a spaceman spiff kind of a situation, you know? Yeah. Uh, Calvin Hobbs take on 65, there you go, Pfizer, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, and Christy S. says, Zealandia continent, a budding Australian continent. Yeah, back in the Cretaceous? Absolutely, Christy S. Good point, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Pendrake says, Star Trek rarely went any place with an exotic atmosphere. Just saying. That's true, Pendrake. I don't know if they ever... You know, even Star Wars does that. You know? Um, yeah... Yeah. Um. Here we go. Even in The Empire Strikes Back, you know, they have to wear respirator gear and stuff like that. They never did this in Star Trek. Did they? They probably did at some point. They had an atmosphere that, uh... Yeah. But y you really don't want big respirator things over your your uh, cast members' faces because, you know, it... You can't see your actors' faces. And it... It does something to the drama, you know? Um... So, yeah, yeah. I can understand why Star Trek never really did that, you know? And they had respirators in Trek. Okay, see, I, I don't know that much about Star Trek. So, Pfizer... Yeah... Uh, and that was inside a creature. Spoilers, Christy. Yes, spoilers. Don't tell people about the space slug. Now you made me tell them about the space slug. Forget I said that, anybody. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh. Shoot, where were we? No, we were talking about. We're talking about the plants that survived the KPG extinction. You see these these rabbit holes that we go down in uh, in a live broadcast like this? It's good stuff. I'm having fun. I hope you're having fun too. This is paleontologizing, everybody. Yeah, taking paleontology, making it a verb. Elminot says atmosphere is breathable. Take off the tanks and masks. Airborne disease or life forms. Why worry about that? Exactly. Yeah. It's all fine. Yeah. Shoot. One of the terrible uh, alien sequels had something like that. Where there's like a pathog pathogen that went into somebody's ear or something. Oh. <laughs> it's garbage. It's so bad. What was it called? Uh, Alien Ark of the Covenant or something like that. Yeah. Anyway. Um. But yeah. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. 
And Guess says that supercontinent with the giant ocean never made as much sense to me as the Earth simply being smaller back in the day, Guest? Well, Guest, you and a, a bunch of other people, too, you're not alone in that, Guest. You're not, actually. Yeah. Here, because we now know that the, the Earth's continents kind of scoot around, or the plates, rather, scoot around... Uh, on top of the Earth's mantle. This is Pangaea about 240 million years ago. So, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, India, Madagascar, and Europe and Asia up here. Yeah, and then Panthalassa on the other side. And, yeah, there was once a, a big debate in geology between people who, uh, who suspected that the, the continents move around, and people who suspected that the Earth was either expanding or contracting, and that's what caused the continents to appear to move. But luckily for you, this just came out the other day. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. From, uh, this is kind of a, You know, this is not the most engaging, but it's got good information. This is from a uh, a science and skepticism podcast called Skeptoid, and uh, here let's let's just give it a brief listen. Yeah. If you've tuned into YouTube any time in the past few years to see what the undereducated alternative history crowd is pitching this week. There's a good chance you've been exposed to the expanding Earth theory. Which yeah. means that the Earth is not a constant size, but has been continuously expanding. Today we're going to see if that claim is really as overblown as it seems to be. Hmm. That's coming up right now on Skeptoid. So, although the expanding Earth may seem like a silly conjecture, it was actually one of the leading You're geophysical models Skeptoid. I'm Brian until quite Brian recently. Skeptoid.com. Anyway, there's a link there in the chat for you, and there's also a transcript right here. If you don't like listening to the podcast, you can just read it here. Um, but yeah, since this is one of their more recent episodes, you actually you can listen to the whole thing without paying for it, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, anyway, some good information about this. In fact, I almost feel like Brian Dunning kind of gives it a little bit too much credence. But uh, anyway, yeah, this is a thoroughly tested idea. This idea that you know, the uh, the changes in the position of Earth's continents, well, maybe it's actually because the Earth is expanding or contracting or something like that. But there are multiple ways that we've been able to test this over the years. And that's detailed in here, so I, uh, I encourage you to check it out. It's a, a pretty neat kind of example about... about how we actually test ideas in science, how we apply the scientific method. It's a wonderful little, like, peek. Uh, a, w a way to peer into how science actually works. So I'd recommend that. Check it out. Yeah. There's also shrinkage. Do they know about shrinkage? I was in the pool. There was shrinkage, Red Bulwark. <laughs> As far as we can tell, the Earth has not been shrinking or expanding. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Totally Normal Will says, Every space rock contributes. I suppose it has to expand at some point. Much less than you might expect, Totally Normal Will. Because also, every spacecraft that leaves also discontributes. Detracts. At least since the 1950s. But anyway, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and he gets it, says Red Bullwork. You know, for every one of those that I get, there's probably ten other references that sail over my head that I have I've no idea. And I go off on some tangent, and I had no idea that somebody was making a joke about something. So, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. But it probably started quite small, right? It says totally normal. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Again, if you want a link to the that podcast episode, there's the link right there. Let's get back to where we were. Talking about which plant survived the asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous and what that means for us today. It compared the genomes of 23 living species from across the angiosperm family tree, including uh, corn, rice, and bananas. Delicious. Using that data, they searched for duplicated genes in each lineage that could be traced back to around 66 million years ago. See, much of the duplicated DNA is gradually lost from the genome over time. Huh. This is usually the case if it's not doing anything important or is causing trouble. But It'll if be that selected against, DNA yeah. does provide some kind of advantage, like gaining a helpful new function, then evolution is more likely to keep it around. And what they uh. found was pretty amazing. Multiple lineages of plants still had duplicates of similar genes that had come from that wave of polyploids that appeared at the end of the Cretaceous. This suggests that they experienced similar environmental challenges at that time, and they responded by evolving the same solutions from their pool of extra DNA. And hmm. many of those genes were involved with two processes, shade avoidance and cold tolerance. Now, uh. the long period of darkness and cold that immediately followed the asteroid impact would have been perhaps the biggest challenge for plants around that time. So this makes sense. Polyploids that could quickly adapt their genetic stress responses to darkness and cold using their duplicated genes may have gained a survival advantage. And Interesting. And that those independently uh. duplicated genes are actually still active. They can be found in the cold tolerance and shade avoidance pathways of many living species. The genetic tools that polyploids forge to cope with that cataclysm are still contributing to the ways their descendants respond to times of stress today. And it doesn't huh. seem to have been the only time this happened in plants either. The scientists saw two other smaller waves of whole genome. Ooh, duplicates. yeah, here at the end of the early Jurassic. No, 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 no. mid, blah, 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 blah. sorry. Blue is Jurassic. At the end of the early Cretaceous, this is the same extinction event that wiped out my beloved Spinosaurs right here. The end Cenomanian extinction event, which also may have wiped out the uh, uh, Benetitalian plants and critters like that. Um, yeah, yeah. For, it may have been sea level drop or like rapid climate change that caused um, like a, a big extinction event. I can't say a mass extinction event because that usually means more than 50% of species on Earth go extinct. But a bunch of a bunch of critters bit the dust right here. They went uh, upstate to live on the farm with grandma right around here at the end of the early Cretaceous. Uh, the end of the Cenomanian epoch. And uh, we there are like major plant groups that seem to just kind of disappear there or become much, much, much less abundant. And then that coincides with the extinction of my Spinosaurs and maybe also, keep this under your hats, but maybe also Stegosaurs go extinct at the same time. Um... Yeah, and maybe a number number of other dinosaurs too. Diplodocids and some decreosaurids and Yeah, this is a bad time. It doesn't get as much attention as the end Cretaceous extinction or the end Jurassic or the holy cow, the end Triassic, which is a mass extinction event. But um but yeah, there are a bunch of critters who were very unfortunate during this time. It was a bad day for them. And uh a bad day, bad series of days. But yeah, what happened? Sea levels dropped. The climate changed, Claire Burr. And uh and lots of lots of critters died. Yeah. In flowering plants on either side of that mass extinction. One occurred yeah. much earlier, around 120 million years ago in the Cretaceous. And this is the one that probably killed Spinosaurus. And the last of the Spinosaurs. Gone after this. Kaput. No more. During the early evolution of two main groups of angiosperms, many of the duplicated genes retained from this ancient wave were involved in water deprivation and salt stress. Yep. 
consequence of the arid climate around that time. Yeah. And the other wave was much more recent, within the last 20 million years. The climate cooled during this period as carbon dioxide levels dropped. Duplicated genes from this event included ones for cold, salt, water, and wounding. We spend so much time talking about animals here on Eons that sometimes we forget how fascinating plant evolution can be. And I'm very much guilty of this here on Paleontologizing. I mean, holy cow. How many animal skeletons and skulls do we have here? From various dinosaurs and... Your token mammal back there, too. We've got a... We got a Smilodon right here, too. Right there. Let's pet the Smilodon. There we go. It's our state fossil here in California. Um, but yeah, yeah. How often do I actually talk about plants? I don't know much about plants, and I really need to... When we start doing some interviews more often, interview some uh, some plant paleontologists, some uh, paleobotanists. Uh, but yeah, we don't we don't talk nearly enough about plants around here, even though plants are often driving the evolution of life on Earth. You know. So yeah, Andy Dentons is sticking the mud plants. I mean, plants are important. You know. Uh, where would we be without plants? Um, we'd be dead. So plants are important. And bacteria, yes. And, and fungi. And insects. And small vertebrate animals. And uh, everything else, you know? Shoot, our, our planet, our planet Earth is this... incredible biome that's able to support so many different kinds of life and the interdependencies there are largely unknown by the general public you know I, ha I hear about these things all the time as a scientist but man there is a complex web of life and if you nuke one species Things tend to slump and collapse, and then you just get mass wasting. It's it's not great. So anyway, big respect to plants. Yeah. And Guest says microbiomes and systems in general seem to be underrated. Yes, I agree. You know, back when I lived in Montana... There's a joke coming up. Back when I lived in Montana... Uh, I used to participate in these, uh, these like medical science studies, uh, where mostly they were testing the efficacy of different like antibacterial hand soaps and stuff like that. So like I'd have to, you know, wash my hands with different soaps and then they would, they would test how effective they were at killing bacteria. Oh, Jack's facts. Thank you. Jack's facts. Thank you, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? Great to have you here. What did you talk about today, Jaxfax? I want to hear all about it. And uh, Iakaias says, Jaxfax raid. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Great to have you here. Welcome. Iakaias. Ixiez. You might be new here. My name is Danny. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Welcome to Paleontologizing. We're talking about the importance right now of other creatures on our planet Earth. Not just animals, not even just dinosaurs, but also plants and bacteria. I was about to get into a book, or a joke, a joke, when you rate it in. Welcome, Jack's Facts. And Robot Ralphle says, debunking Bigfoot. We learned all about Bigfoot. Uh, he tried to convince us that Bigfoot isn't real. Obviously, we didn't believe him easy. Kiki Lausa, Laswa. You know, I might have to back up Jack's facts about this. Sorry. You know, I, here. I will not tell you that Bigfoot isn't real. I will tell you he is real. And he lives in all of our hearts. But as for there actually being a gigantic, megafaunal, North American primate living in the 
conifer forests of Western North America. Um, I don't know about that. Yeah. But Jack's facts, thank you for, uh, for also spreading some science here on Twitch. I appreciate you. And welcome, Ixkiaz. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Um, yeah. The real Bigfoot was the friends we made along the way. There you go, Red Bulwark. Yes. It was the Discovery Channel shows that we <laughs> produced along the way. That's the real Bigfoot. Along with the ghost swamp truckers and the... Uh, the real pawn stars of Beverly Hills and whatever else. Um... Uh, yeah, uh, Jack's facts. There is a wonderful video that I'd love to share with you. Maybe one of these days we'll do a uh, a special stream about this. But I don't, I don't really study paleoanthropology, mammalogy, any of this stuff. But um. Yeah, and wait, Kiki Laswa, did you, did you do a, is that an AI image that I'm, do you want me to click on there? Is that what that is? Here's some very real images of, uh, anthropologist and scientist Eugenie Scott from the National Center for Science Education giving a talk about Bigfoot and other wild men of the woods. Here. Uh... I'm not putting on makeup up here, but I, I was trying to figure out how I could, maybe I could set up this little mirror so I could actually see what's going on behind me because the way this works, I anyway. have no idea yeah. what's going on unless I'm doing this all the time. And there you go, really robot. Really <laughs> Ruffle, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the National Center for Science Education is a rather better known organization than Bay Area Skeptics. Uh, NCSC is located in Oakland. And yeah, we do have our work cut out. It's older uh, than the National Center for uh, we'll get, to the, get to the Sam Squamches. Uh, health kind of so, sense of. Well, so Sam Squatch, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, hey, a language. <laughs> this is supposed to be a PG broadcast. I'm sorry, I can't show you more of that. Um, but yeah, yeah. A anyway, uh, back to Eugenie Scott. Uh, denying everything, but but uh, looking critically at uh, claims of the paranormal, claims of um, uh, healthcare, and claims of uh, other other scientifically related claims that in one or more ways uh, don't exactly track what mainstream science uh, would predict, which doesn't mean that we deny that there are new discoveries to be made. Obviously, yeah. there are many new discoveries. Anyway, to be this made. is. Uh... But there are many, many claims that are made in the name of science that do bear scrutiny. And what we try to encourage is an appreciation for science, which certainly <laughs> is shared with the science cafes, and an appreciation of the importance of critical thinking as a way of making decisions about the natural world. So this is a really, really interesting talk, and I highly recommend it. Holy cow. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really excellent. And Eugenie Scott, who is the former director of the National Center for Science Education, uh, she gives this presentation in front of a live audience, and then there's a bunch of, like, you know, uh, Bigfoot believers, 
uh, Sasquatch enthusiasts in the audience, and they, like, actively challenge her on a bunch of these points, and there's, uh, there's some interesting drama here, so I would highly recommend you take a look at that video. Again, there's the link there in chat for you. And, uh, critical thinking, I know, right, Robot Rao. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, it's really good stuff, but Eugenie Scott has got a background in physical anthropology, and she's got some really interesting takes on this, and, uh, if you're interested in uh, in Sasquatches and Big Feet and Wild Men of the Woods, uh, I would highly recommend you take a look at this. Uh, uh, this gets repeated a couple of times so you can see it. Uh, anyway, so if you want a scientist take on this, this is pretty interesting stuff. And a person who was about six feet tall um, walked in the same pathway, and they tried to make measurements, you know, knee to knee and shoulder oh, to shoulder. Oh, this is talking about the Patterson Gimlin film here. Um, uh. the with those kinds of estimates, is that they the, the camera angle was not very reliable, and if you're going to try anyway, to make an estimate, uh, if anybody here is a huge fan of the Patterson Gimlin film, then I've also got some bad news for you. Um, or some interesting news for you. I'll put it that way. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Here, I don't know if you can listen to this in full anymore, but here is a pretty definitive kind of deconstruction of the old Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot film. The one that, uh... It's so prevalent in our modern culture. The thing is, the, the people who created the film, the people who actually perpetrated this hoax, they've been interviewed. Like, we know who the guy in the Bigfoot suit was. It's a matter of public record. And you can learn about that in that link right there. So yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, but that film itself has become such an icon of, uh, of popular culture. That, yeah, shoot. It, it's even been, like, parodied in, uh... in, like, major Hollywood films and stuff like that. Um. Yeah. Uh. Where was that? Oh, shoot. Where was this? In that, uh, the Jim Carrey, uh, Grinch movie, they even parody this film. <laughs> like, there's a reference to it that, like, they just kind of take on faith that, like, audiences are gonna, they're gonna know what we're talking about. They're gonna understand this reference. Um. Yeah. I, I tell you, Google image search gets worse and worse every week. I swear I've looked this up before and it came right up. Um, yeah. Here we go, I guess. This is the best we're gonna do. But here's a, a still from that movie. <laughs> and it's supposed to look like Bigfoot. Anyway, Bigfoot, really, really fascinating, like, supremely interesting artifact from popular culture and folklore. But is it a real animal? I can give you this perspective as a paleontologist. We've got precisely zero fossil information that suggests that there is a giant 
North American forest ape. And holy cow, do I wish that were, were, were true. How awesome would that be? But we've got zero fossil evidence of it. We've got zero compelling evidence from scats or modern carcasses, photography, anything like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. They eat each other's bones to hide the evidence, says Robot Ralphle. I mean, that's what we call a special pleading. If you're going to get into, like, yeah, debate terminology, that would be what we call a special pleading. But yeah. Red Acid says the biggest problem with Bigfoot is smartphones. Yeah. They can't afford those uh, those contracts. Too expensive. The iPhone. Too expensive for Bigfoot. No, I know what you mean, Rat Acid. Everybody's got phones nowadays. Everybody has a, like, 12 megapixel camera in their pocket, pocket with them at all times. If there really was a population of gigantic, you know, forest apes walking around in North America, we would have footage of them every single week and yet we don't and uh genie talks about that here somewhere um i'm looking for that particular clip right here uh yeah let's see I think it might be here. Let's take a look. One thing you want to consider is where do these creatures live? Well, yeah, there we go. They live all over the place. Um, there's a Texas Bigfoot group, and they have uh, um, marked where uh, Bigfoot has been spotted, they claim, in Texas. Yep. You can find maps like this for virtually any state in the country. Yep. Bigfoot appears not just in the Pacific Northwest and in Northern California, which is where we're used to thinking about Bigfoot as Californians, Yep. They occur in, uh, in Nebraska and in Because they really want to hang out here in the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, who wouldn't want to hang out here? The weather is gorgeous. There's so many things to do. There's culture out the wazoo. Who wouldn't want to live here in the gorgeous San Francisco Bay Area? No, I'm not getting paid for this. Why am I even doing this? Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, so anyway, yeah, and uh, Chris Kabloom says, we know locations and have videos of remote no-contact tribes, yet no Bigfoot, so, yeah, Chris Ka. yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah, anyway. Uh, Major Warp says only in America. Yeah, maybe Major Warp. Anyway, it's, again, this is a wonderful application of the scientific method. It's like, I'll just let Eugenie talk about this some more. Uh, the Ozarks yeah. and the Appalachians and in, in Texas, not too far from Austin, apparently, from the looks of this one map. I would agree with you there, Stink. So, okay, if they live all over the place, does that make it less likely or more likely that they really exist? Hmm. I would suggest that it probably makes it less likely because if you are a very large mammal... Yep. You're, you're probably going to be fairly specialized to a, well, not, not overly specialized, you know, like a koala bear or something like that. But there's going to be a panda. some limitation yeah. to the kinds of environments that you can live in. Yeah. One thing, uh, consider a large-bodied primate like a gorilla. Now, gorillas live in a tropical environment. And, uh, and stink, I mean, the, like, tr true Bigfoot partisans would vehemently disagree with you there. They say that he's from 49 states, like all of the U.S. states except for Hawaii. So, yeah, yeah. 
uh, I don't know, people really, really, really want this creature to be real. And I think Bigfoot is really interesting as a piece of folklore. But it just makes absolutely zero sense as a real animal, you know? Um, because milk is too expensive there. <laughs> Agreed. And that's, I guess, why we don't have them here in the Bay Area either is because uh, is because real estate prices are too high, right? Yeah. Yeah. Environment. Yeah, some huh. of the big foot, you know, some of the big guys <laughs> live in tropical go, yeah. environments. But most of them are reported from temperate environments. And western Texas is not a tropical environment. Okay. No. The yeah. They live in tropical environments. They have to take in, given their body size, they have to take in something. I'm gonna like blow my nose. I'll be right back. Yeah. They tend not to eat very calorie rich food. A gorilla eats mostly leaves and um, shoots, uh, the fruits when they can get it, um, nuts if they can get it. Uh, but they're, they're mostly folivores, they're mostly, mostly leaf eaters. And a gorilla will spend something like half of his waking hours eating. You know, you go to True. You see the movies, yeah. the graphic and so forth, the gorillas, they got these big guts. Reason for that, because they have to keep eating constant, almost oh, constantly yeah. in order oh, to yeah. get enough calories to keep that big bulk going. And the kind of food they tend to eat, leaves tend to be not very high calorie foods. Mm -hmm. And because that's the major component. The of guest the makes diet. a good point here, yeah. yeah. So you really have to eat a whole lot. Okay, what is there to eat in Western Texas? That would be comparable to keep a, a, a... I mean, shoot. Uh, Twinkies? Corn dogs? Uh, whatever else you can get at the local gas station? You know? Uh, pork rinds? Um, yeah. Trash? Pfizer? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Probably goes to McDonald's late at night. There you go. <laughs> yeah, he could eat the corn. I don't. I don't know if I don't think much corn grows in Western Texas, to be honest. Um, yeah, but uh, Kodali says if Ursus spileus didn't go extinct, it might have evolved into that form, into a giant ape-like creature. I mean, Apologies for being skeptical about that idea, Kodali, but no, 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 no chance. Yeah. I have a really big... Yeah, state fair food. Yes, exactly. Elephant ears. Um, uh, what are some other state fair foods, everybody? Um, come on, help me out here. State fair foods. Um, funnel cakes. Uh, pork rinds. Cotton candy. Uh, fried Twinkies and Oreos. There you go. Thank you, Murph. Turkey legs, creatrix bread, curly fries, corn dogs, deep fried psychokinetic energy Twinkies. There you go, stick. Con conch fritters? What kind of state fairs are you going to, Aquastorm? <laughs> Hot potatoes, deep fried butter. Yeah. Or, holy cow, if he is incredibly lucky. Um. Yeah. Holy cow. The king of all foods. Right here. The perfect chance to make my patented space age out of this world moon waffles. Let's see here. Caramel. Waffle batter. Liquid smoke. <laughs> Ooh. Waffle runoff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, curse these uh, non family guy. Ew. This is obscuring the end of our video here. He wraps the whole thing around a stick of butter. And he puts a toothpick through it. Fattening. Fattening. <laughs> oh, YouTube! Curse you. Uh. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what Sam Squanch is eating. Mammal like that. 
Those are the kinds of questions you need to ask if you're going to look scientifically at Bigfoot. Yeah. Because the first question you want to ask is... And I can get extensions that can get rid of that? You're kidding me, Kiki. Well, let me... Here, let me, let me search. How do these observations fit with everything else we know from science? Okay. If we know from science that big-bodied primates have to eat a lot of food, then what does that tell you about the carrying capacity of the environment? You'd want to ask certain other things about um, Bigfoot or Yeti. You'd want to ask hook. things like, what's the minimum population size that you would need in order to keep a gorilla size or larger than gorilla size population of organisms living for thousands and thousands of years? One of the real um, interesting, from a standpoint of a physical anthropologist, Oh, hang on a second. Let's let's try that again. Um, yeah, here we go. Moon waffles. Let's see here. Carol. Oh, we got we got to refresh. The perfect chance to make my patented space age out of this world. Moon waffles. Hmm. Caramels. Waffle batter. Liquid smoke. Okay. Waffle runoff. No, it's still there. Shoot. Uh, here. Um. We'll let Eugenie continue to talk about this. Good information. Well, I try YouTube enhancer. For thousands and thousands of years. One of the real um, interesting, from a standpoint of a physical anthropologist, which is what I was when I was college professor, uh, one of the really interesting explanations for where Bigfoot came from is that he's actually a remnant population of a, an Asian ape uh, that's known from um, South Asia um, and Southern China called Jai yeah, she's going to talk about Gigantopithecus and why that's not really a, it doesn't really make sense. For oh boy, so I can tell that the uh, the it's working, but uh, I think this is the same snail chaser showed me this. I don't know if I like this, but here let's let's go back and let's see if this works now. The perfect chance to make my patented space age out of this world moon waffles. Hmm. Let's see here. Caramels, waffle batter, liquid smoke. Okay. I'm sure Bigfoot is eating this. That's why we're watching it again and again. No! Oh, it's still there! Have you tried turning off annotations in the settings of the video? Let's try that. Uh, annotations off. Still there. I don't know if I can get rid of this garbage. Uh, and now I'm going to have to get rid of those extensions too. But I can do that after stream. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, back to Eugenie Scott talking about this. Gigantopithecus. Now, Gigantopithecus was a really big ape. It had yep. a skull about the size of my laptop. I mean, this is really a big creature. It was estimated to probably be eight or nine feet tall, bigger than gorillas. Uh, we've ha we have uh, uh, skulls and we have teeth. We don't, uh, last I looked, I don't think we have any <laughs> material below bad, yeah. the neck um, <laughs> of uh, Gigantopithecus, but we know that uh. there's one really big <laughs> ape. And the idea exists in the Bigfoot community that yetis and big feet, one Bigfoot, several Bigfoots, okay, that yeti and Bigfoots um, really are just descendants of these uh, Gigantopithecus apes that managed to get themselves Move lost YouTube. in some Let's try that, right corner acid. of the world, like Western Texas, I guess. Um, or, you know, like the, the Pacific Northwest or the Himalaya Mountains. Whoa, 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 hang on. And therefore um, have managed to survive undetected all these. Uh, Platebury Design, welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It is great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. I don't recognize that name. Is it your first raid here, Platebury? 
the sub the S U B A M F played Barry Design. Thank you for uh, for coming in here. The S U and played Barry. Welcome to the channel. Howdy, howdy. My name is Danny Anduzo. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old fashioned science outreach. And you've just raided in very kindly, and I appreciate you for it. And uh, the SUBAMF, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, first time writing in, but I'm very familiar with your content. I'm married to Tabatai Cooking. Beautiful. Well, Pladberry. Shout out to Tabatai Cooking also. How did your stream go? How was your art stream? What did you work on? I want to hear all about it. And up, oh, hang on. I just heard a very disconcerting noise from my 3D printer. Let me check on this real quick. If you do cooking streams, you understand. I will be right back. We're still good. We're still good. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. And sub is fine. You got it, sub. Thank you for joining us. We'll see if we can get you a gift sub for you, sub. Thanks for being here. And thank you, Pladberry, for the raid. I'm wondering if anybody here in chat would like to see a welcome video to kind of help introduce them to the channel. Help them understand why a paleontologist is here on Twitch in the first place? Like, what is a fossil scientist doing here on Twitch? If you would like to know, go ahead and type in a number one into chat. Uh, because, uh, legend has it. That if enough number ones show up in the chat, and if our regular music stops, which it seems to have done, then previously recorded Danny might materialize before our very eyes and explain what all of this is about. So if you would like some exposition, previously recorded Danny... I think we'll help you out with that. In fact... There he is right there. Sneaking up behind me at this very moment. So without further ado... Thank you again, Pladberry Design, for the, for the raid. I appreciate that. Here comes Previously Recorded Danny. Previously Recorded Danny, we beseech thee... Take it away! Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell ya. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the Paleo Lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said that the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of fieldwork digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. 
2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Chasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen, the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Truarcuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs. But I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jumps or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids who want to see them lining up. At a home museum, I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. Uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Pladberry Design for that wonderful raid. I really appreciate that. Shout out to Pladberry Design and to Tabatai Cooking. Really appreciate that raid. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. And the sub, thank you, thank you for the, uh, the kind words there. Really appreciate that. Yeah. If you've got any questions, now's the time. We were, uh, we were looking at this video. 
Jax Fax raided in earlier. Thank you, Jax Fax, for that raid, too. We're looking at this video as to why... As cool as the idea is, Bigfoot is probably not a real animal. And Eugenie Scott will tell you all about that in this video, but... Uh, and thank you, Pride Pooch, for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you also to Joseph Rooks for the follow during the welcome video. Thank you, Joseph. Great to have you here. Oh, I hasten to add that uh, a little... Some of the information in that that introductory video with previously recorded Danny. Well, he is very charismatic. He is not the most up-to-date. I made that video a, a few years ago. And uh, I no longer teach full-time. Now, this is my full-time job here on Twitch, believe it or not. I get to talk to all of you wonderful people about fossil science five days per week. Except for next week. Taking a few days off. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. And this coming summer, I'm hoping to be able to live stream some field work to show you what it's like to dig up dinosaur fossils live on stream. So stay tuned for that. We're going to have some field work live streams this summer. Come hell or high water. I'm trying to get the Starlink internet to actually work. And I'm kind of wrestling with the company over that. And it's not been easy so far. Um, but I'm trying to do that for you. So let's... Uh, Let's cross our fingers. So yeah, yeah. If you need a, some input for a setup for field work, it, it all comes down to whether or not the Starlink equipment actually works, Joseph Brooks. But I appreciate that, thank you. Um, I've had the Starlink dish for about a year and three quarters at this point. It's not worked for a single solitary minute. So it all comes down to tech support for that, whether they can get the thing working, which we'll see what happens. So, yeah. I just hope people don't expect a major discovery every 15 minutes. No, this is Twitch. I hope people have got a better idea than that, Red Bulwark. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and... Uh... Ixquiez says, Is the beige shirt the classic paleontologist outfit? Not really. Most paleontologists today... In fact, actually, let's do a, a Google image search. Shall we? I want to see what Google Images seems to think about paleontologists. Paleontologist. Uh, this is kind of an archetypical outfit with the adventure vest. Hardly any paleontologists actually wear that. There's a paleontologist at Waco Mammoth National Monument. She is, of course, dressed in the uniform of a National Park Service ranger, which is legit. But most paleontologists, in my experience, they kind of dress like this. Plaid shirts are kind of the uniform of the geologist. Sometimes you've got synthetic fiber jackets and stuff like that. Most paleontologists really don't dress like me. This is more typical wear for a paleontologist. T-shirts, long sleeve cotton shirts, jeans or zip-off pants. Yeah, I tend to wear a lot of, like, military surplus clothing. Because it's cheap and it's uh, durable and etc. But yeah, yeah. This is kind of more typical wear for a paleontologist. Jeans, baseball caps, khaki pants, stuff like that. Yeah. But I tend to wear a lot of military surplus gear because it's cheap, it's durable, it looks okay, it's easily acquirable. And, uh, and it keeps the sun off me and the bugs off me, too. So, yeah. 
Uh, but paleontologist Barbie. And now everybody's talking about Barbie because of the new movie, right? Um, here's paleontologist Barbie right here. And she's kind of dressed like Ellie Sattler from Jurassic Park, isn't she? Except she's got a shirt with some dinosaurs and stuff on it. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Usually my shorts are a little bit longer than this in the field. Usually my bandana is not as pink, but this is not too dissimilar from what I wear in the field. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you love a good plaid? Your name would suggest as much plaidberry design. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of geologists in Seattle. There actually are. There's a, a I think, a disproportionate number of geologists in Seattle. No kidding. Joseph Rooks. I know you're kidding, but yeah. Astonishing. Simply astonishing. Neptune. The most singular specimens I've encountered in all my distinguished career. But enough about my work. What did you want to show me? <laughs> Neptune, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. We needed a rock channel. There are several geologists here on Twitch. Stink. Uh, one of them is Rocket Sage. You should go follow her. She is a professional geologist. She does field work. She does outreach. She teaches students. Go check out Rocket Sage. Can we get a shout out for uh, for Sage there in the chat? But yeah, yeah. Neptune says, just found your stream. Really enjoying it so far? Well, thank you, thank you, Neptune. I appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologize. Yeah. And uh, let me... Uh, thank you, Lenina. There you go. There's a shout out for Rocket Sage. Good stuff. Yeah. She knows far more about rocks than I do or ever will. Check out Rocket Sage for some pure geology content there. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. And you're good, Lenina. No worries. No worries. Rocks are nice. Some of them are. Caterpiggle. Nice, the, uh, the mineral. There you go. Yeah, good stuff. Anyway, paleontologist Barbie is not a joke, not a an AI creation. Uh, this is an actual product that was offered by what has Has not Hasbro Mattel. Man, you know, I say it's produced by Hasbro and uh. That's the sort of thing that's liable to get me, uh, get me knocked off of Twitch. You know, shoot, you can't mess around with, uh, with ad stuff like that. You know, you never know what might. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, you don't mess with uh, these major brands. They'll, uh, you know, they'll send a drone strike after you. So yeah, and there you go, Stink. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> Any anyway, recurring bit today. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh. And Ios is here. Ios, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Ios. I hope you're having a good day so far. It's good to see you, Ios. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Uh, you're actually here just in time, Ios, and she has a new hat! No, Bat Meddler, no. <laughs> oh no. Uh <laughs> Uh I'm gonna I'm gonna 
resist the urge to show another Simpsons clip here. And we, everybody, are going to get into what was promised for the day. Some who wants to be a paleontologist. Yeah. And Stink says, I just became a level two subscriber. Thank you. Thank you, Stink. Holy cow. Do you get, like, cooler emojis? I think you get the, uh, we're talking about geology. I think you get the hammer emoji. Type in, uh, exclamation mark, hammer. Uh, there you go. Nobody else gets that except for level two and three subscribers. So there you go. It doesn't kick in for 16 days because of your gift sub. Give me 16 days? Well, in 16 days, you can use... You can use, holy cow... The Excalibur of the Paleontologist. The Rock Hammer. This beautiful angelic instrument that we as paleontologists use to unearth the ancient past. My own Rock Hammer doesn't look like that. It looks like, uh, like this. Uh... Best wing supreme 12 ounce chisel edge rock hammer. There we go. It looks like this. This is, well, mine's a lot older and rustier than this one. And it doesn't have the. Mine's a lot older, so it doesn't have the yellow bottom to it right there at the end of the. At the proximal end of the handle, doesn't have that. But anyway, this is my personal rock hammer that I have. So yeah. Also breaks you out of Shawshank. Yeah. Added benefit there, Marth. Yes, indeed. Yeah. This might have a name like Thor's... Jolfnir. Um... I call it Danny's rock hammer. So maybe it has a name? Maybe? I don't know. Should I give it a name? Chat? I guess I could. I actually got that for my 12th birthday. Do I have it here or is it in... Uh... Hang on just a minute. Let me see if it's here in my office or if I have it packed away in storage. Give me a second. It's packed away in storage right now. So I'd have to I'd have to go into the closet and dig around in all of my field gear to find it. But uh Yeah. Anyway. My rock hammer is called Daniel? No, it's it's not, Kiki. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I it would need a more lofty name than that. See, the word, the name Daniel is too close to Danny, you know? It's like, you know, my name is Danny, you know? And you know me, I'm, I've got no pretensions. I'm not some sort of fancy lad, but the name Daniel, sorry to any Daniels who might be watching, but it, it sounds like, uh, Somebody who might wear some sort of a crushed velvet suit and have some sort of a frilly collar or something like that. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Um, yeah, here, here's a classic, here's a classic Daniel right here, you know? Note the frilly collar, the fancy dress and everything. This isn't me. You know, you know me. Yeah. Um, anyway. 
Yeah, that's that's not me. I'm Danny. You know. <laughs> oh, Daniel. Well, goodness, I. You know, maybe if my uh, my monthly income were to go up a hundred times, maybe I could call myself Daniel. But I don't think I can afford such a lofty name right now. You know? Um, uh... Yeah... Uh... For instance, you know, this might be a Daniel right here. Apparently this... Is, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt? This is FDR? Around age four or five? Something like that? Um, you know, he could be named Daniel, you know? I don't have the kind of money where I could afford fancy dress like this, you know? So, yeah. Well, that's a manly dress, says Red Acid, yeah. You know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, possibly one of the greatest U.S. presidents ever. And this is what he looked like when he was a kid, apparently. At least for this, uh, for this photo shoot. Anyway, that's too fancy for me, you know? I eat beans out of a can. I sleep under the stars for three months out of the year. Can't afford that kind of thing. I'm not a Daniel, you know? <laughs> Daniel Boone wasn't a fop? I, I don't know, Mayor Space. Are you sure? I don't know, but yeah, yeah, Daniel Delano, basically the same name, yes. Anyway, everybody, we are about to get into our semi-weekly game of who wants to be a millionaire or who wants to be a paleontologist, so if you're ready for that, well, if you're ready for that, then you're ready for that. I, I hope you're ready for that. Because we're about to get into that. About once every few weeks, we have a review game here on this channel called Who Wants to Be a Paleontologist, styled after Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. And uh, I've got a bunch of questions that I wrote in the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire style. Stick around, even if you weren't here for the past two weeks, because this will still be a lot of fun and you will definitely learn something. I guarantee it. But it's also... A lot of fun as chat strives to win a million dollars. And who wants to be a paleontologist? A millionaire. There you go, Stink. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, all of that, is starting right now. Well, welcome, welcome to Who Wants to Be a Paleontologist. So glad you could join me today. I'm your host, Danny Anduza, dinosaur paleontologist. And today, right now, I will be testing how well you've been paying attention for the past two weeks during our paleontologizing Twitch live streams. Here's how this works. I will be showing you some questions, especially curated, to test how well you've been paying attention over the past two weeks. When you see the question, you will read it. You will type your answer into the chat, either A, B, C, or D. There is no E, there is no F, there is no Omega or Epsilon or Gamma, etc. A, B, C, or D. 
And then I will be kind of taking the general temperature of chat. If there's a bunch of A's, more A's than B's or C's or D's, we'll go with A. This is a collective effort, chat. All of you are in this together. Just like in life, that's how it works in the real world, you know? So yeah. And if things are too close to call between A, B, C, or D, then we might have a poll. There are also three lifelines available to you. There are ten questions. I'm going to start you off at like $2,000 because, uh, well, in the interest of time, we got to start off there. There's going to be ten questions here. And if you answer them all correctly, then you win one million imaginary dollars. And think about how much that could change your life, to have a million imaginary dollars. Holy cow. So... Let's go ahead and get into it, shall we? Our first question. Oh, and shoot, let me... Uh, no, we don't need to change our streaming category. It's okay. For $2,000, our question is as follows. A new paper suggests that theropods like T-Rex actually had lips similar to creatures such as A. Turtles B. Komodo dragons C. Rats D. Mick Jagger Hmm. What do you think, chat? What do you think? We talked about this extensively last Monday when we were covering this new paper. What do you think? I'm seeing a lot of bees. I'm hearing some people chuckling at D. Novelheart says D. Casually Average says D. Tommy Platicus says but B, though. We're getting a lot of bees here. B. Is it turtles? Is it Komodo dragons? Is it rats? Or is it Mick Jagger? Tyrannosaurus and other theropod dinosaurs. What do you think, chat? What do you think? Bees? Is it Red Bulwark? D isn't wrong. Are you sure, Tommy Platicus? <laughs> well, it seems like chat is pretty well set on B for Komodo dragons. And who am I to question the wisdom of chat? Hmm. Let's go ahead and select B. But is this your final answer, chat? What do you think? Let's just go with it. And you are correct. Holy cow. Very well done. $2,000 in your pocket now. You advance to the next round. And let me just show this for anybody who uh, maybe wasn't here for Monday's stream. Uh, here we go. From the journal Science. T-Rex had lips, a new study suggests. Uh, there we go. And uh, I tend to agree with these findings. I think it makes a lot of sense. But yeah. Uh, dinosaur skulls most closely resemble those of lipped lizards and iguanas. And the lipped lizard that we are talking about here in particular is this one that you will recognize from your Twitch emotes, no less. Komodo hype. There you go, Murph. Yes, indeed. Yeah. The Komodo dragon. Even though this animal has really, really prominent teeth, you can't actually see that when it opens its mouth because those teeth are covered by soft tissue and covered by lips. I mean, holy cow.
Here is the skull of a Komodo dragon. Right here, and they have got some pretty prominent teeth. You would think it would be difficult to cover those up, but those lips really do the trick. So dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus and other theropods, according to this new paper, based on the information that they present, you might not have been able to see their teeth when they had their mouths closed, or maybe even when they opened their mouths. If they indeed had oral soft tissue structures like Komodo dragons have. And these are pretty formidable animals, by the way. You do not want to cross paths with a hungry Komodo dragon. It will eat you up uh, if you're too slow to get away. I mean, they, they rarely attack humans. But uh, uh, anyway, any modern lizard is pretty fierce. Yeah, Murph, agreed. Yeah, respect them. Don't, don't fear or hate them, though. That's what I'll say. But yeah, indeed, the Komodo hype emote is a Komodo dragon. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. So what would a Tyrannosaurus look like with lips? Well, not too different than you might imagine it otherwise. Yeah. Uh, much like this. The teeth might still be visi visible if you have the right angle there, but you just can't really see them too much around the margins, if that makes sense. Really, a more formidable animal in some ways. Its mouth isn't going to dry out because, it got, because it's got these big gaps for air to go in and then dry it all its saliva. Instead, this is an animal that you know, just as fearsome with better protected teeth. Pretty cool. So yeah. Yeah. So anyway, very nicely done, chat. Very nice indeed. Two thousand dollars in your pocket. We we're skipping all of these questions here. Uh I'll see about doing correcting that next week. But anyway, are you ready for the next question for $4,000? Doubling your money? I think you might be. Let's go ahead and get into it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. There we go. Don't know what happened there. For $4,000. This quintessentially Aussie critter has been floated as a local replacement for the Easter Bunny. Is the answer A, the Wallaby? B, the Bilby? C, the Kangaroo? Or D, the Koala? Oh, and what do you say there, Chet? Chet? What do you say? Hmm. Seeing a lot of bees there in chat. Yeah. Uh, B for Bilby. So says Gulganek. Oh, I... Well, let's see here. I'm seeing a lot of bees. And so far, only bees. Casually average says D. Arnar. Says Tommy Plodicus. Don't make fun, Tommy Plodicus. It's a venerable accent. An R. It's not kind to make fun of this kind of thing. But yeah, a bit more koala. Roses and tea. <laughs> oh no. Anyway. <laughs> uh, chat seems pretty set on B for Bilby. A replacement for the Easter Bunny for, uh, for Straya. The Bilby. Is that right? Uh, well, if you say so, chat, let's go ahead and say B for Bilby. Is this your final answer? Let's do it. And you are correct, of course. Very nicely done. 
Yes! The Bilby is the correct answer. We were talking about this on, what was it, Wednesday's stream? Monday's stream? Monday's stream. Yeah! The Easter Bilby. This is pretty lovely. We've actually not seen this video before, but let's... Let's take a look at this and hope it's any good. What is this? Canciones para criaturas poco comunes. Los animales más extraños de la tierra y la música que ellos inspiran. Is this in Spanish? Not a long-nosed rat. The bilby oh. is in fact a mini marsupial. Yep. The female has yeah. the faces backwards. Rather unusual. The bilby's eyes are poor at seeing far or seeing near. Fortunately for the bilby, its strength lies. Well, they can see medium. I hope. I hope. In its ability to hear. Yeah. Hi, welcome to Songs for Unusual Creatures. I'm your host, Michael Hurst. And today Interesting. We're going to learn all about the bilby. Okay. My friends and I are also going to create our own Bilby masks, which you can make at home. And the band huh. will play a song that I wrote about this unusual Australian creature. Wait, what? <laughs> We're going to make Bilby masks today. Do you guys know about the Bilby? Uh. The Bilby is a nocturnal marsupial that comes from Australia. Do you know what a marsupial is? Yeah. So other marsupials include kangaroos, koala bears, yep. wombats. So yep. It's like all marsupials come from Australia. That's pretty, that's pretty close, yeah. Yeah, th there's a few marsupials from outside of Australia, like the uh, Didelphus virginianus, the, uh, the Virginia opossum, is also a marsupial. There's a few other possums that come from South America, I think, but yeah, almost all the rest of them are from Australia. The bilby can be found yeah. in northwestern and central Australia. They're yep. nocturnal, which means they sleep during the day and are awake at night. And these big ears give them a powerful sense of hearing. Yep. They're also excellent yeah. burrows and build their own system of tunnels to live in and move between. Pretty cool. This helps protect them from predators. Yep. So you notice the mask has basically just three parts in the front. And no, that mask is not something from Donnie Darko, despite what you might so what think. What we'll do first is we're going to color in the face and ears, and then we'll cut out the mask, <laughs> and then you can wear it and dance to the song. Why are you wearing that stupid human mask? <laughs> No. Uh, we talked to someone in Australia because we couldn't find any bilbies in the United States. Uh, so I'm here in the land of Skype with uh, Paul Davies, who's the senior keeper at the Nocturnal House at the Taronga Zoo. It's about uh, 8.30 p.m. here in New York City. What time is it there in Australia? 10.20. Wow. A.M. in the morning. Our bilbies are yeah. now having their night as you're heading into it. So you're on anyway, let's let's fast forward a little bit and get to the Easter bilby, which is the thing that we're actually trying to. Oh boy. Never mind. I guess maybe we'll look at at uh, the Easter bunny versus the Easter bilby. Let's take a look at this. Uh, skip the intro. Coming up on today's show, ditching the Easter bunny. A kebab in space. And we don't want to hear about that. And a but, very special yeah. birthday. But before we get into that, why don't you subscribe? It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's okay. But a group of merm, merm, merm. Super cute. They are. There we go. Instead, conservationists reckon at Easter time, we should be focusing on our very own big eared cute. There we go. The Bilby. Yeah. Super, super cute. They are the most incredible uh, native. So rabbits are invasive in Australia. Because of introduced predators yeah. and habitat loss, there's now only one species of bilby left, the greater bilby. That's why the Save the Bilby movement, which is all about protecting these little fuzzballs with things oh. like breeding programs, have been teaming up with chocolate manufacturers. So how do chocolate bilbies translate? Very cute, to Golgan egg. Yes. Bilbies? reminding people that we've got these national marsupials that they need our support as well so by buying one of these chocolates you're actually donating oh, 20, 20 cents to save the bilby fund which goes a long way in uh, enabling us to continue our buying. that is if eating this chocolate really lovely. is going Holy to cow. help it's a tough job but i might just have to do it this easter you know <laughs> 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 speaking so of so anywhere this 
Uh, I would like to vow to uh, get myself an Easter bilby before next Easter. I gotta figure this out and uh, and get one so that I can I can show it off on stream beforehand because that is gonna be really really cool. That is gonna be one of my goals for next year here on Paleontologizing. Anyway, bilbies are uh, an endangered marsupial in Australia and. They're endangered in part because of the introduction of rabbits to the country in uh, the 20th century. So, yeah. Anyway. But, yeah. And you'll sort it. You'll sort it out. Roses and tea. Again, British, like you were saying. <laughs> uh... Roses and tea, I, hey, I would love that. Get some Easter bilbies, I'd be all about it. So yeah, yeah. I'll send you one if I can find it still. I would love that, roses and tea, I'd love that. Shoot, I'm not above eating expired chocolate. Certainly not. If you can send me an Easter bilby, I will be deeply grateful, roses and tea. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, very well done, chat. You got that for 4000 bucks, the bilby. Yeah, a local replacement for the Easter Bunny and big salute to the bilby. Now, are you ready for our next question, chat? I think you are. Let's go ahead and get into it. For $8,000, that's a lot of money. What is the fastest known dinosaur? Is it A, Gala, Gala, Gallimimus, Belatus? It's not Troodon. <laughs> is it B, Tyrannosaurus Rex? Is it C, Falco Peregrinus? Or is it D, Velociraptor Mongoliensis. What do you think, chat? Hmm. And does one of these fly, says T-Mat Tricks? Maybe. Maybe. Well. I'm seeing a lot of C's in chat. I'm seeing one D. Ambervix says Peregrine. What could that mean, Amber Vix? Hmm. C sounds like a peregrine, so C. Darn those Latin names that are sometimes almost too descriptive. Chat seems pretty set on C right here. So you know what? Let's give chat what chat wants. This is our final answer. I'm going to say yes. And of course, you are correct. The Peregrine Falcon is the fastest animal on planet Earth. Not just the fastest dinosaur, but as far as we can tell, the fastest animal which has ever lived. There's a chance there could could have been uh, faster animals, but shoot, here we go. Here are, uh, well, here's a Peregrine Falcon not being particularly fast. Actually, just sitting on top of her chicks right here. This is one of the cow falcons whom we were talking about yesterday for Thursday Bird's Day. This is Annie, presumably, sitting on top of her chicks. Yeah, she's sleepy. <laughs> uh, but let me find you a video about peregrine falcons being fast. Yeah. Uh, right here from from the from Vonks. Why peregrine falcons are the fastest animal on Earth? Let's take a look. When I googled the fastest animal, this is what I got: a cheetah. A cheetah. Not true. A little mammal bias, maybe. This yeah, thank you. Thank you. Earth has a max speed three times greater than the cheetah. Yep. 
Okay. Yeah. Moves through the skies between 40 and 60 miles per hour. But when they're diving toward their prey, they can reach speeds over 200 miles per hour. That comes out to yep. 293 feet per second. It's Holy like cow. It's the length of a football field in 1.2 seconds. That's incredible. This DC block. So Pretty how impressive. Is it possible for peregrines to dive this fast? I love this video. This is really, really nice. A well done. Is around the size of a crow, uh, weighing between one and three pounds, with the wingspan up to three point six feet. They prey on other birds by dive bombing them and snatching them midair. The first thing you see when a peregrine goes into its dive, also called a stoop, is their bullet-shaped bodies. And yeah, so Caliban says on a on a dive though, which is true. I mean, some of you who want to scoff at this might be like, "Well, Danny, you know." The peregrine falcon, it's not actually, you know, this is not through powered flight that is actually moving at such tremendous speeds at 240 miles per hour. But the thing is, the peregrine falcon has special evolutionary adaptations to actually achieve such speeds in a dive. And so I'm inclined to give them this title. You know, not just the bullet-shaped body right there, but also, like, the uh, the nose cone type things that they have over their nostrils to help keep their uh, their nostrils from being overwhelmed by the inrush of air in a steep dive. It's it's pretty incredible stuff. So, you know what? I'll give it to them. Notice yeah. how the peregrine tucks in its feet and sweeps back its tail and wings. And Bat Mather says, I suppose if a bison ran off a tall enough cliff, it would not be half as fast. As a peregrine falcon, Bet Medler. No. 90 feet per second per second. You, you reach terminal velocity pretty quick. Is an animal just falling? Peregrine falcons can move faster than terminal velocity because of these various traits that they've evolved. It's pretty cool. Also, a bison will not survive that fall, whereas a falcon will do this routinely to catch its prey. It's pretty cool. So yeah, Bet Mather, I know you know, but it's it's important to talk about this for anybody who is feeling the same thing but didn't didn't voice it in chat. So yeah. Yeah. This wind turbulence maximizes maneuverability, lift and speed as it cuts through the air. Yep. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. It wouldn't be able to do this nearly as efficiently if it had broad wings like a hawk or an owl. Yep. But the peregrine's wings are pointed and angled back. And because of its stiff, unslotted feathers, it experiences less drag. The wind yep. will pull on these feathers on other birds. Very Parents cool. also have a large keel. That's this breastbone. A big Huge keel. keel. Stronger Look at that. Muscles. Huge. <laughs> that sternum is incredible. It's like practically the length of the bird's entire body. That's the sternum right here. Your sternum is, you know, yeah, about that length, about that long. And this bird, it's hypertrophied. It's one of the largest bones in the body. In fact, it might actually be bigger than their tibiotarsus, or their, it's certainly larger than their femur. That's really, really interesting. That the uh, the keel, that sternum right there, I think might be the largest bone by volume in the body of a peregrine falcon, which is nuts. Yeah. Acute vision allows them to spot prey a mile away. The nictitating membrane, or third yeah. eye, helps to maintain their vision in their high-speed dives. And the secretory yeah, gland open your keeps third their eyelid, from man. out because of all that wind. Yep. But none of this would be possible if the peregrine couldn't breathe. The air speeds that peregrine falcons experience while diving would make it impossible for most animals to breathe. Yep. But they have a bone in their nostrils to slow down the airflow. Yep, and this apparently helped inspire the design of modern jet aircraft, which is really, really, really cool. I mean, holy moly, is that neat. Uh, this is something that, you know, in modern aircraft, it took a long time for people to devise these, uh, these nose cones like that within the jet turbine in order to deflect air properly. At high speed, and yet peregrine falcons evolved this millions of years ago. Pretty awesome. They also have robust hearts that beat around 600 to 900 beats per minute. 
all birds have a vastly more efficient respiratory system than mammals. Which they got from their dinosaur ancestors, and yeah. finally catch our prey, the peregrine is pulling around 25 Gs. Yeah. Oh. Compare that to an F-16 fighter pilot who endures up to 9 Gs during Welcome, summer. Dark Native. Good to have you here. Howdy, howdy. Check out to you, too. Alone, peregrines are formidable birds of prey, but it isn't their only adaptation of note. Footage from our friends at BBC Earth shows where this wanderer has made its mark in some unexpected places. Yep. After a sharp recovery from near extinction in North America, bustling yeah. cities with soaring skyscrapers and towering cathedrals have become mini peregrines' new kingdom. A plentiful hunting ground with high perches and deliciously plump pigeons. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> And you can watch a peregrine falcon couple raise their chicks right here. Here is a live cam on top of the bell tower on the University of California, Berkeley campus. And if you go to Cal Falcons, let me just type it in here. Uh, CalFalcons.Berkeley.edu. You can see all of this for yourself. We were just uh, we were just talking about this yesterday. Here are links to the t-shirt design, to uh, the various live cams. You can see all this footage of the young hatching out of their eggs, and yeah, even some image macros and stuff like this. Very cool stuff. Yeah. So there you go. The fastest dinosaur that has ever lived is, of course, Falco Peregrinus. You were correct about that, chat. Good for you. $8,000 in your pocket. Let's progress to our next question. Shall we? Yeah. And, uh... Let's see. Dark Native says, hope to see how the giant model is coming. Oh, well, shoot. We are, uh... We're still printing that right now. In fact, I've got pieces of the lower jaw of our Allosaurus model right here to show you. And is Majot here in chat right now? Majot, if if you are, please make yourself known. But yeah, these are parts of our, uh, our Allosaurus lower jaw, which this should slot in right here. And this should fit in right back here like, oh goodness, where was it? Like this, there we go. Yeah, parts of our Allosaurus lower jaw right here. Uh, we are printing more and more of this. And Majot made an incredible contribution. Majat is here in chat. Apparently, Majat, thank you so much for the four four boxes 3D printer filament. I will be able to accomplish the printing of this Allosaurus skull so much more quickly than I otherwise would be able to. Again, we are printing... This life-size Allosaurus skull, it's going to be over a meter long, and I am very, very excited for it. Let's wait for it to load here. There you go. There it is, and here it is with an apple for scale. There you go. Shows you how big this thing is going to be. Huge Allosaurus skull. How much is this model going to cost? I mean, I might have enough filament with everything that uh, that Majat has donated, so I don't know. Maybe about $150 total in terms of filament. But yeah, this is going to be truly remarkable. So yeah, yeah, pretty cool. And thank you again, Majat, for your, uh, your incredible support. I appreciate that 
more than you know. Where am I going to put it? The scout? Uh, uh, somewhere. It can go here under our juvenile T-Rex. It's it's going to take up so much space, though. It could go up here. Yeah. I got to figure that out. Yeah. It's going to go somewhere. But it's going to be very impressive wherever it ends up. So, yeah. Yeah. Pretty incredible. Can't wait. Thank you again, Majat. Anyway, with that, let's get back to our game of who wants to be a paleontologist. And congratulations, chat. 8000 dollars in your pocket. Let's see if you can advance to the next stage. Question nine, sixteen thousand dollars. Can you do it? Are you ready for the next question? I think you are. Let's try it. For $16,000. This 19th century naturalist is said to have discovered the idea of extinction. Is it A, Georges Cuvier? There should be an S at the end of his name. Shoot. Georges Cuvier. French name. Yeah. Is it B, Richard Owen? I guess that could be Sir Richard Owen. You know, we're not all about titles here on paleontologizing, though. Richard Owen. C, Charles Darwin. Old Chucky D. Or is it D, Gideon Mantell? We were just talking about this yesterday. What do you think, chat? Who might it be? A, B, C, or D? I see a lot of A's here in chat for Georges Cuvier. And without further ado, you know what? Let's not draw this out any longer than it has to go. Georges Cuvier. Chat seems to be pretty insistent on and of course you are correct very nice indeed chat yes indeed Georges Cuvier is the renowned French scientist who is said to have discovered the idea of extinction, although that is, I don't know, what's to a broad concept like that? Who can said to have actually discovered it, you know? But, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you remembered that, chat. Yeah. Let's see if we can find a short video about this, perhaps. Uh, Viz Cuvier? Georges Cuvier? Uh, here's this. Yeah. Georges Cuvier was a French scientist in the 19th century who was an expert at comparing animal species by their bones. One day, yeah. he was something strange. Some we just watched this yesterday, didn't we? didn't quite match those of animals that were alive in his day. This discovery yep. was very puzzling. In Cuvier's time, most people thought that all life had been created at once and had stayed the same through many, many generations up to the present day. Animals well, that didn't wasn't the case. Another, and they certainly didn't disappear altogether. So uh, where did wrong. these strange bones come from? Huh. To solve this puzzle, Cuvier got out of the museum and visited mines around Paris to study rocks and their fossils. Anyway. He noticed that strange bones seemed to be buried deep in older rocks, and as you moved up through younger and younger rocks, they disappeared entirely. Hmm. That gave him an idea. Yeah, the idea of extinction. Some animals are not found today because they completely died out thousands, even millions of years ago. And the yep. history of their appearance and disappearance is preserved in the rocks. Yep. Anyway, Cuvier and, uh, and this remarkable inference, extinction. You know, we'll be talking about more, more about this, I think. We'll probably be talking more about Cuvier next month in May. Because I think the anniversary of his birth or death might be in May. Maybe both. Uh, let's see. 
When did George Cuvier die? May 13th. I think that's... Yeah. We'll be talking about Cuvier on the 13th. The extinction of Cuvier and the extinction of various... Most species. We'll be talking about on the same day. Mar May 13th. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh... Well done there, chat. Well done. $16,000 in your pocket. I think you're ready for the next question for $32,000. let us go to that. Uh, for $32,000, your next question is, which of the following dinosaurs is known from only one solitary specimen is it a allosaurus b ceratosaurus c carnotaurus or d stegosaurus what do you think chat hmm. let's see here uh we're getting a lot of C's here. You know what? I'm not going to prolong this any longer than it has to go. C for Carnotaurus. That's the one you want, chat? Uh, well. Is this your final answer, however? You are correct about that. Very nice. Yeah. I made a huge point of this last week. It is indeed Carnotaurus. We did a whole live stream about that. In fact, I think it might even be up, might even be up there on the, uh, the YouTube page. There we go. Yeah. There we go, from April 4th, the meat bull, Carnotaurus. Most famous dinosaur known from just one specimen? Yeah, so Carnotaurus. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, this dinosaur right here, known from all kinds of different appearances in pop culture, multiple cartoons and movies and video games and all kinds of other stuff, this dinosaur, which is kind of a modern celebrity in terms of different theropod dinosaurs, far more famous than most, it is known from but one Specimen. Carnotaurus. Known from one specimen. Uh, uh, here's a skeletal diagram right here. This is how much material we actually have for this animal. We don't have the distal end of its tail or... The distal parts of its hind limbs. That's all we've got. One skeleton of this animal. So, yeah. Yeah. It is one heck of a specimen. It is, Lenny. Definitely, yes. Even got preserved bits of skin, which is really, really cool. But I want to make the point that, honestly, the majority of different species of dinosaur that have been named are known from just one specimen. It's... Rarer than you might imagine to have multiple individuals of different dinosaur species that are known. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. But very nicely done, chat. You got that. Are you ready for question 11 at $64,000? I think you are. Let's get to it. Yeah.
$64,000. We're not in Little League anymore. We're getting up there. Tradoon. So it's common to be rare? I guess it is Red Bulwark, yeah. For $64,000, your question is... Which dinosaur genus is Jurassic Park's Brachiosaurus actually based on? Is it A, Apatosaurus? B, Brontosaurus? C, Camarasaurus? Or D, Giraffe Titan? I'm seeing some Ds so far. Victoria says D for Durder. You remember the D answer, Scout? Well, shoot. We've got such solidarity in chat. This makes me smile. I just sh sure hope that you have this right, chat. D for Giraffe Titan. Let's go with that. Is this your final answer? Hold on to your butts. Let's say yes. And there you go. Very nice, chat. Very nice indeed. Good stuff. Yeah. Giraffe Titan is the correct answer. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Here's a little video snippet that gets this part right. In fact, I think we can watch it from the beginning. It's very short. Because, man, do they get this part right. Take a look. Come on now. Pitched skull and extremely poor right, 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 right. The real... Goodness. Here we go. Yeah. So, you want to create living dinosaurs using preserved DNA and frog genes to fill in the gaps? Well, yeah. they won't be 100% accurate. But how do the 1993 Jurassic Park dinosaurs compare to the latest science? Let's find out now. Animated Jurassic Park. This is actually a fairly decent video. A signature head hump with added nostrils, an S-shaped 30-foot neck, and trunk-shaped legs. The real Brachiosaurus had a thicker neck, a longer body, and more unique feet. Their head yep. hump was less steep, and their nostrils were closer to their mouth. It's also possible, like many dinosaurs, they had more colorful patterns. They also yep. couldn't chew like a big cow. Yeah, so all of that, fair enough, but... What is Jurassic Park's Brachiosaurus actually based on, if not the North American Brachiosaurus? Nor would they rear on their hind legs. All yeah, they, they almost certainly could do that, so ignore that part. Though, Jurassic Park's Brach was actually modeled off the similar Giraffe Titan, whose proportions yep. were closer to the film version. JP's yep. Dilophosaurus has a... Yeah, anyway, if you'd like to watch the rest of this video, which is pretty decent, I was actually kind of impressed with it. Take a look at that right there. But yeah, Giraffe Titan. Uh, and what the heck is this, Google? G garbage. That's not Giraffe. That's. Uh, anyway, Giraffe Titan. Uh, the largest mounted actual, you know, fossil bone dinosaur skeleton in the world is in Berlin's Natural History Museum in Germany. It is Giraffe Titan. Yeah. Here is a link to that article. Once known as Brachiosaurus bronchi, it has since been renamed Giraffe Titan, and that is what causes that disparity. So, yeah, does that make sense? I hope it does. Anyway, very nice chat. Very nice indeed. $64,000 in your pocket. I hope you're feeling good about that. Because here comes the next question for $125,000. Getting up there now. These get trickier. For $125,000. This Australian sauropod has a beautiful and newly published skull. 
just this past week? Is the answer A, Antarctosaurus? B, Ostrosaurus? C, Retosaurus? Or D, Diamantinosaurus? Getting trickier here, getting trickier here. I see some D's in the chat. I see some D's. Pluckman's Mustard getting in on the action, too. Thank you, Pluckman's Mustard. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of D's. Well, well, well. Hmm. D for Matilde. Says roses and tea. Well, you know what? If you want D, we can go ahead and do that. $125,000 is a lot of money, but uh, Hold on to your butts. let's go ahead and do it. And you are correct. Very nicely done. $125,000 now in your pocket. Very, very nice. Yes. It is true. We just talked about this yesterday, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, here we go. A nearly complete skull of Diamantinosaurus. Uh, from the Upper Cretaceous Winton Formation of Australia and implications for the ev early evolution of titanosaurs. Here is a link to that paper right there. Very nicely done, chat. Very nicely done indeed. The skulls of sauropod dinosaurs are extraordinarily rare. These long-necked, four-legged dinosaurs, the skull is like the most delicate part. It's very rare that that actually gets preserved. And here we've got one. A skull also being, like, the most informative part of the animal. Here we've got a lovely example from Australia. Very cool. Very, very nice. And our 3D printer, I just heard a weird noise from that. Let me check on this real quick. I'll be right back. Ah, we're okay. Yeah. And there you go, Golganek. Yeah, yeah. Here, let's, uh... Let's continue now. Uh, to our next question. You are three questions away from the million dollars, chat. Let's see if you can get to it. Next question, starting now. For 250,000 big ones, that's a quarter of a million. Science, what science ever done for us? TV off. And the 8-bit squid, thank you for the follow. Coming in at a very tense time, 8-bit squid, but thanks for following. Appreciate you. Welcome to Paleontologize. Which American paleontologist had a museum built especially for him by his robber baron uncle? Is the answer A, Joseph Lydie? B, Edward Drinker Cope? C, Othniel Charles Marsh? Or D, Henry Fairfield Osborne? What do you think, chat? Charlie's Dragon says C for O.C. Marsh. Golganek says C for Othniel Charles Marsh. Plockman's Mustard says C. Patrick Crusader says C. Thalo says C. Seems like everybody says C so far. Well, well, well. Lenina says C. That's a lot of money. $250,000. I hope you 
hope you're right about that. Because we're going to go ahead and go with C here. But is it our final answer? Hogan says, I was thinking it was one of the Bone Wars dudes, but not sure which one. Let's hope it's O.C. Marsh for C right here. Hold on to your butts. And you are correct, chat. Very nicely done. Yes, 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 it was. Othniel Charles Marsh. In the uh, the Bone Wars between Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope, both of them came from uh, various points of privilege. Uh, Cope, with the mustache and goatee, came from a wealthy family. Marsh did not, but he did have a wealthy uncle whom he persuaded to build him a paleontology museum in New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale University is. And indeed, Marsh was the de facto curator of the Peabody Museum of Natural History, financed by his wealthy uncle, George Peabody. Born into a modest family, Marsh was able to afford higher education thanks to the generosity of his wealthy uncle, George Peabody. Yeah, and then later on, Marsh, uh, excuse me, Marsh was basically awarded a museum by his uncle. Uh, uh, let's see. Come on now. Uh... Yep. Let's see. The Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale was founded with a donation of $150,000, which is probably like several million in today's money, by George Peabody on Marsh's suggestion. So there you go. Yeah. You got it right, chat. And good on you for paying attention. $250,000 in your pocket now. Well done. Yeah, as that museum is still around, Pendrake. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good stuff. Now, are you ready for the next question? $500,000 on the line in our next question. I think you're ready. Let's go ahead and go for it. Let's do it. For half a million, you're just two questions away now from the full million dollars. Our question is, in the late 1920s, what was a major factor in the cancellation of the American Museum of Natural History's expeditions to Mongolia? The AMNH in New York had been conducting these expeditions to Mongolia for several years, and they stopped. What was a major factor in them being stopped? We talked about this on Monday. Is the answer A, sandstorms, B, lack of funding, C, sandworms, or D, the auction of a dinosaur egg? What do you think, chat? A, B, C, or D? Scout says C for sure, choosing the <laughs> sandworms answer. Uh, yeah. 
25A says I'm going with sandworms. It's always sandworms. But they create the spice, 25A. And the spice must flow. Oh, what do you think? Hogan says D. Thalo says D. Murph says boo auctions. And Murph says D. D for definitely, says Bet Medler. Oh, and Golganek suggesting D there. Scout says, I think it is D. Well, well, well. Let's go ahead and try D here, although that'd be an awful shame. Be an awful shame for you to stall out now. So close to the million dollars, but. Hold on to your butt. Let's go ahead and try D right there. Is this your final answer? Let's say yes. And of course you got it. Very nicely done. Yes. So when the American Museum of Natural History S Central Asiatic Expeditions to Mongolia ended up discovering dinosaur eggs... Uh, this was a huge boon for their publicity. And, uh, let's see here. I think I've got a clip right here, right? Yeah. Let's try this. Started there as a janitor. And yeah, Roy Chapman Andrews. To curator. Andrews' drive and charisma made him the perfect figurehead for an ambitious expedition to Asia to look yeah. for the remains of early human beings. Yep. And once again, as it has happened a number of times in paleontology, serendipity uh, uh, played a, a, a major role there, and they didn't find any remains of early humans, but they found some tremendous uh, dinosaur remains. Yep. Some uh, fossils that clearly changed, once again, uh, the, the history of, of dinosaur paleontology. Yep. The discovery of dinosaurs in Europe, Africa, America, and now China had a powerful effect. And Mongolia. People were amazed that these incredible creatures had once roamed the entire world. The museum's trips to China and Mongolia became known as the Central Asiatic Expeditions. But then, during the trek in 1923, yeah. the expedition became renowned for discovering a nest of eggs, thought yep. to be those of a protoceratops. Yeah. However, Roy Chapman Adams really wasn't a great scientist. And yeah, anyway, so those eggs ended up being a huge publicity boom for them. But this huge publicity boon ended up being a tragedy in the sense that they decided they would auction off one of these eggs for what was a paltry sum at the time. It was like, well, actually, no, maybe not that that paltry. It was like fifteen thousand dollars, which would be a lot of money in today's uh, in today's cash. But this was a publicity stunt that they did. But the Mongolian authorities heard about this. And they said, holy cow, you're taking these remarkable fossils out of our country? And you're auctioning them off for profit? Hold your horses there, pal. And they cut off access to the American Museum. They could no longer... Uh, that and a number of other things. It was like the communist takeover of Mongolia also certainly didn't help things for the American Museum. But, uh, shoot, it was the auction of the eggs that really kind of made them, made Mongolian officials sit up and take notice and go, this is not okay. So once again, dinosaur auctions end up being just a curse on dinosaur science. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, there are dinosaur auctions that are ongoing today. Yeah. This, uh, three Tyrannosaurus specimens, actually. Uh, set to be auctioned off in Switzerland next week. An absolute travesty. Just enough to make a paleontologist weep. I'm working on a video about this, and I'd, uh... I'd like to share it with you when it's done. But anyway, auctions, never a good thing in fossil science. Never. It's bad juju. But you know who's not had bad juju so far is you, chat. Been doing quite well. And you are now one question away from the million dollars. I think you very well could get there. Yeah. So let's go ahead and try that, shall we? And do I have an episode on museums, collectors, auctions, and such? Check out the YouTube page, Stink. I've got a, uh, I've got a video where I, you know what? Let me find it for you right now. I showed up on uh, on British news to talk about this with uh, Michael Pertillo. Here we go. And where is this? Uh, right here. Yeah. There we go. So, uh, David, first of all, uh, yep. bones and fossils, which are diverted from scientists who could study them. Uh, David Waterhouse is the senior curator of natural history and geology at Norfolk Museum and joins us from Norwich. Hello. Good to speak to you again. Yeah, and, nice to see you, Michael. And from Northern California, dino dinosaur paleontologist Danny Anduza, who hosts Paleontologizing which can be viewed on Twitch. What is that, Twitch? Hmm. Uh, how, obs how very obscure. Hmm. Uh, there's a link there in chat for you. You can watch that whole interview if you would like to. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Are you ready for the final question, chat? For the one million dollars... I think you are. I mean, holy cow. Hold on to your butts. Let's do it. This is the last one, chat. It's this or nothing. For one million dollars, your question is... Which museum currently holds Mary Mantell's original Iguanodon tooth? Is the answer A, the Natural History Museum of London, the venerable NHM? Is it B, the Dinosaur Farm Museum on the Isle of Wight? Is it C, the Oxford Museum of Natural History? Or is it D, the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tongarewa? <sighs> Million dollars on the line here, chat. What do you think? We just talked about this on Tuesday, I believe. got an A. I've got some D's. And some more D's. Lenina says D. 
But Mother says D for sure. The sun or air ended up in New Zealand, says Bet Medler. Murph seems to agree with that. Golgan X says, I believe in the mustard, D. Plockman's mustard also said D, yes. Amelia Bedelia is going to go with D. We talked all about Mary Mantell for her birthday. Uh, no, it was it was last Friday. We were talking about that. Uh, let's see here. Thalo also said D. Seems like we've got a general consensus forming that it is the letter D. Well, if that's the case. Go ahead and go with D. Million dollars on the line. That can buy a lot of packets of ramen. I'll tell you that. With a million dollars, you could dig up hundreds of dinosaur specimens. That's a lot of money. But if you're confident about it, chat, we can do it. D, the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tangarewa. It's an unusual place for an iguanodon specimen from England to end up. But, uh... Hold on to your butts. Let's go ahead and try it. You got it, chat. Holy cow. Very nicely done. Yes, indeed. Congratulations on the million dollars right there. Very nicely done. And to prove it to you. Yeah. Here is this right here. Uh. <laughs> Goofy little intro here. Hang on a minute. Murph. Holy cow, Murph. Last time I'll play with dinosaur. Dinosaur. Murph, that's extraordinary. Thank you so much. Holy cow, Murph. I don't even know what to say. Thank you very, very much, Murph, for those 30 gift subs. There are now 30 people in chat who will not have to watch any ads for the next 30 days. Thanks to you, Murph. 30 people times 30 days. That's 900 days of no ads. Thanks to you, Murph. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that more than you know. Holy cow. Beautiful. Thank you very, very much, Murph. And look, we're we're only six subs away from getting to our sub goal for the day. Thanks to you, Murph. 30 of those, of those 44, are thanks to you. That is excellent. Murph used a portion of their winnings to buy gift subs. It, it appears so, Hogan. Holy cow. And I am deeply grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Murph. Seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your support for this channel. Thank you for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. It really does mean a tremendous amount to me. Thank you very, very much. Holy cow. Murph says, thank you for the learning. Thank you, Murph, for the support and for keeping this learning going through your your financial support. That's incredible. Here, let's let's go ahead and uh, and take a look at this quick video here so I can prove to you that indeed 
That original iguana on tooth now resides in New Zealand of all places. Holy cow. And big paleo salute to Murph. Thank you, thank you, Murph. There's a reason you've got that VIP can you badge. Can what a dinosaur looks like? Well, of course you can. So it's hard to imagine that for most of our history, people had no idea that dinosaurs even existed. True. That hundreds of millions of yeah. years, if the Earth was ruled by these huge creatures, they wouldn't have thought it was possible. And what it took to change that was a very unusual tooth found by a very unusual English woman. To yeah. Me, this is Mary Mantell. I think one of the most valuable objects that we have here at Te Papa. Uh, in terms of the history and philosophy of science, it is immensely valuable. Pretty cool. I love that. There's this, this big box that he has right here. Look at that. Big box. Inside it, a smaller box. Philosophy of science. It is immensely valuable. Look at that. So this is a fossil, and it was collected in 1820 in southern England, in Sussex. This is considered to be the very first fossil to be recognized as dinosaur. Well, the word dinosaur wouldn't be coined until 1842, so that's not quite correct, but whatever. It was found by allegedly the wife of Gideon Mantell, who was a yeah. country doctor. He lived in... Show her picture. Show Mary Mantell. And uh, this particular tooth... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang, hang on here. Hang on here. Let's get some respect for Mary Mantell here, shall we? Um, yeah, we did a whole stream about her back on, uh, there she is right there. Mary Mantell was the one who actually found this or recognized it as significant in the first place. So, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, Mary Mantell. Here's a little tweet that I did about her. Here's a link to that. Right there. So, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Forget Gideon. It's Mary Mantell. This particular tooth was found by Mary Ann Mantell. There we go. Yeah. When she and her husband were visiting a quarry, some... He did show a picture of her. This is her in later years. Hogan. That'll do it, Hogan. Thank you for those five gift subs. Really appreciate that, Hogan. Holy cow. And one more from Yimel Chokan. They have given two gift subs in the channel. You got us there. Holy moly. Thank you very, very much. Sub goal attained. Thank you very, very much. Holy cow, 50 out of 50. Beautiful. Beautiful. That is extraordinary. Thank you so much to Murph for those 30. Hogan for those five. And Yumel for that last one, which went to SV Harkin, who is clearly grateful for that. Everybody's happy. Thank you so much for that incredible level of support. Fewer than 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. And Stink! Three of them are leading this expedition. That is excellent, Stink. Holy cow! Why not overachieve? Thank you, thank you, Stink. That is extraordinary. Thank you very, very much. Holy cow! Stink. I appreciate you. Look. 50... 55 out of 50 there. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Belint, thank you for those 100 bits. Very much appreciated, Belint. Thank you so much. Holy cow. Good stuff. Spent no expense. And Maximum Darnage... Another gift sub for Maximum Darnage. Exquisite. Bet Medler, thank you for the 200 bits. Always love WWTBAP. 
I'm glad you enjoy Who Wants to Be a Paleontologist, Bet Medler. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for the 200 bets. Thank you very, very much. Good stuff. Good stuff. Holy cow. Exquisite. Thank you very, very much. Brilliant. Brilliant. Ah. We're on our way to a... Well, we've already got to a level 2 hype train. I mean, if we get to a level 5, I'll play you some ukulele songs to round out the stream. To finish us up here. But, uh... Yeah. S.V. Harkin says I actually knew some of the answers. I'm glad, S.V. Harkin. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Happy Friday to you, too, M.S. Goggins. Thank you, thank you. And Stink, thank you for that other gift sub whose alert should be popping up here presently. How do we get to the uke? Thank you, Golgonek, for those 200 bits. Oh, I appreciate that, Golgonek. Thank you, thank you. We want a song? We got to get to a level 5 hype train, which would take a good few more subs and bits and stuff. So we'll see. We'll see. But yeah. Yeah. And Kiernow says, I'm a bit late, eh? We're, you know, we're only five hours into the stream, Kiernow. Yeah. Um. Yeah, here. And, whoa, 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 hang on. Roses and tea. Thank you, thank you. For those five gift subs. We'll see if we'll get some ukulele. I mean, holy cow. We're uh, approaching a level three hype train, I believe. No, approaching a level four. If we get to a level five, I'll play some ukulele songs live on stream. So we'll see if we get there. Holy cow. For the bilby, says Roses and Teeth. Thank you. Roses and tea. Thank you. Thank you. Holy moly. Wait, hang on. Ios. Ios. Ios just changed things with those five gift subs. Ios. Holy moly. Thank you, Ios. Holy cow. How are you doing, Ios? I hope you're having a great day. Hope you're having a great time where you are. Thank you for your support and stink. Holy cow, stink. We are 54% uh, of the way to a level 5 hype train there. We are so close I can almost taste it. Or maybe smell it in your case. Stink, but thank you, thank you for, for your incredible support. Holy moly. Halfway to level five, we are, we are almost there. Just a few more subs and uh, maybe a few more bits. And we'll be there. Dark Native, yeah, on fire indeed. Holy moly. Um, we very, mel very well might get this. Holy cow. Lordy, 300 bits from Lordy there. Lord Hypers, Lord Hypers. Thank you, Lordy, for your support. Thank you very, very much. We are so close. 60% of the way there. Just a few more subs, and that that very well might do it. The people demand it, says Murph. The ukulele is, is laying in a case right over there. In all the world, there are fewer than 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. That'll, oh, that'll do it. Three of them are leading this expedition. Thank you for supporting this dinosaur paleontologist. Roses NT. Yes! Holy cow! That will do it. Let's play some ukulele, shall we? We're on our way to a level six hype train, but level five is our threshold. Forgetting. Some ukulele songs. 
Let's break out the old uke, shall we? Let me grab it for you. Yeah. All right, here we are. So, I am not a musical virtuoso. I couldn't even be what you'd call a musician. But I do know a few songs on the old ukulele. Some songs about science. So why don't we do a nice trio of songs real quick. After I get this thing tuned up. A little bit sharp. Tuning, tuning. There we go. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Holy cow. 77 out of 50 gift subs for the... That is extraordinary. Thank you so much. Let's start off with an old classic, the Dinosaur March. Then we'll do I'm a Paleontologist, and maybe we'll do the Galaxy song after that. How does that sound? Uh, so without further ado... Let's have some ukulele here. You know, I, I feel a little bit strange wearing, you know, a uh, uh, a suit and a tie and holding an ukulele. But you know what? We'll make this work, shall we? I might, I might actually have to roll up my sleeves here a little bit in order to better uh, grip this thing. There we go. That feels better. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for the hydrate, Maximum Darnage. Here, cheers. Our first song is called The Dinosaur March. This is a lovely little warm-up. Uh, this is my student's very favorite song back when I was teaching full-time. I think you'll enjoy it, too. See if you can pick out the parts of the song that I modified to make them a little bit more paleontologically authentic. You know? It goes like this. Many, many years ago before the people came the animals upon the earth, they did not look the same. They lived for 170 million years, but now they are no more. Except for birds, which as we now recognize birds, are the last living descendants of dinosaurs. Strictly speaking, dinosaurs never really went extinct. There are now 10,000 species of living dinosaurs descendants. The birds that survived the KPG mass extinction, asteroid impact, and now they're everywhere, and today we call them birds. They were the dinosaurs. Apatosaurus diplodocus. Stegosaurus allosaurus. Stegosaurus allosaurus. Ankylosaurus and Triceratops. Tyrannosaurus Rex. So that's the first verse. When I was first learning this song from the music teacher at the school I used to teach at, it didn't have a second verse, so I had to write my own. It goes like this. We can learn about these awesome beasts by studying their bones. Skeletons under the ground that partly turned to stone. We dig them up and we clean them and we raise them off the floor. To build a dinosaur, a Patasaurus diplodocus, Stegosaurus allosaurus, Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus rex. There you go. Uh, that's the dinosaur march. Amber Vix wants to know, at the school, you did you have to walk uphill both ways to get to? Kind of. Uh, unambiguously kind of, actually. I used to work in the San Francisco Presidio, and I did actually have to walk uphill both ways to get to the school. And then, and then downhill to get back to the bus, which took me to the train, which I took to get home. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, 
That's the Dinosaur March. Let's do I'm a Paleontologist next, and then we'll do the Galaxy song after that. How about it? So our next song comes from a band called They Might Be Giants. And that ambiguity is uh, not important. They, they do some pretty cool songs about science. This comes from their album, Here Comes Science, which is like a science album for kids. The song is called I'm a Paleontologist, and I like this song a lot because when I sing it, it's got a lot of veracity to it. You'll see what I mean. I love digging in the dirt just a pick and brush finding fossils is my aim and so i'm never in a rush because the treasures that i seek they're rare and ancient things like velociraptors jaws or archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids who want to see them are lining up at our museum i am a paleontologist that's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. Could it be an herbivore crushing plants with rounded teeth? Or a ferocious carnivore who moved so quickly on its feet? It's like pieces of a puzzle that I'd love to try and solve. So much fun to think about. How a species has evolved, and all the kids who want to see them are lining up at our museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. Holy cow, Anonymous Gifter! It's the last time I'll play with dinosaur. Dinosaur. Twenty-three gift subs. Anonymously gifted, Anonymous Gifter, you are as generous as you are mysterious, and yet, you do not work in mysterious ways. Look, you've brought our, our sub count for the day. 23 seems like a specific number, and it is. That's 100 out of 50 gift subs for the day. That's, you, you've doubled our sub count. You, you've doubled our sub goal. Holy moly. Thank you, Anonymous Gifter. Let's, maybe we'll do an extra song for you, Anonymous Gifter. Thank you, thank you for your incredible generosity. That is, uh... Is truly extraordinary. Can we get some paleo salutes for our very generous and mysterious anonymous gifter there? Holy moly. Um, anonymous gifter. Through your generosity there, along with the generosity of these other gifters today, uh... Ios and Stink and Maximum Darnage and Hogan and Murph. All of you are helping to uh, to continue my mission of science outreach here on Twitch. I again, this is believe it or not, this is my full time gig nowadays. Every time you gift a sub, you are helping continue this mission of science outreach, you're literally putting food on my table. You're funding my research and my field work and my science outreach. I am deeply grateful for that. I've been able to turn this into my full-time gig because of generous gifters like you, and I, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world to be able to stream full time here on Twitch and um I don't even know what to say. This is uh this is pretty special. Roses says treat yourself to two packets of ramen for dinner. You know, I think I might. I think I might. Thank you, thank you. Um holy cow. Do I appreciate that? 
extraordinary. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. You know what? Let's let's have an extra special song here. Uh, let's do the Galaxy song, and then we'll do uh, we'll do Jolene after that too. And thank you, Golgadek, for those two hundred bits. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we were almost done with the I'm a Paleontologist song, and thank you, Tommy Plotticus, for that gift sub. We're now at, look, 106, but that was just one. Oh. Birds are dead on. Holy cow, birds. Amazing. Birds are dead on. Just change things with those five gift subs. Thank you. Thank you. I don't even know what to say. That is truly extraordinary. Holy cow. 106 out of 50. Seriously, I... Uh... <laughs> Thank you for your generosity. That is, uh, that's extraordinary. And I really appreciate it. I am deeply grateful. What a privilege to be able to to bring science outreach to you and and get paid for it. I mean, uh, many of my colleagues not not so lucky in that regard. So thank you very very much. I appreciate it. Holy cow! Love this community. Me too, Amelia Bedelia. I am appreciated by many, Bat Mother. You know what? I appreciate you just as much. Holy cow! For our next song, let's do uh let's do a song that's not explicitly about paleontology, but it does deal with kind of a scientific mindset. It deals with some large numbers. It deals with that sense of awe that you get when you consider your place in deep time or your place in the universe. It's called the Galaxy Song, and uh I think you'll like it a lot. Who could tell me where this song is actually from? Let me know. I'll I'll play it for you. Uh, this is a special song to go out to anybody who might be, uh, feeling a little bit down in the dumps today. Maybe you've had kind of a lousy day. Maybe you've had a lousy week. Might need a bit of a pick-me-up, a change of perspective. This song is all about that. It's called The Galaxy Song. It goes like this. Just remember that you're standing on a planet that's evolved, revolving at 900 miles an hour. It's opening at 90 miles a second, so it's reckoned A sun that is the source of all our power Now the sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see They're moving at a million miles a day In an outer spiral of 13,000 light years wide Of the galaxy we call the Milky Way galaxy itself contains 200 billion stars. It's a hundred thousand light years side to side. It bulges in the middle of 13,000 light years thick, but out by us is just 3,000 light years wide. Wide. <laughs> Voice is still a little froggy. Now, uh, 3,000 light years wide. Uh, it, let me start that second verse over. Kind of lost the rhythm there. <laughs> now our galaxy itself contains 200 billion stars. It's a lot. Uh, 100 million stars. It's a th uh, th th side to side. Side. It bulges in the middle. 13,000 light years thick. But out by us is just 3,000 light years wide. There we go. It's 30,000 light years from the galactic central point. We go round every 200 million years. And our galaxy is only one of millions of billions in our expand, in our amazing and expanding universe. Whoa, 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 whoa
My voice isn't quite what it is usually right now. Still in getting over this, whatever it was I had this week. So I appreciate your patience. But here comes the conclusion of the song. Now our universe itself keeps on expanding and expanding. And all of the directions it can win. As fast as it can go, the speed of light you know. 12 million miles a minute, and that's the fastest speed there is. So remember when you're feeling very small and insecure. How amazingly unlikely is your birth. And pray that there's intelligent life somewhere. <laughs> Got the chords all messed up again. Pray that there's intelligent life somewhere up in space. Because it's hard to find down here on Earth. Something like that. <laughs> Ah, thank you for uh, sticking with me as I watch that. But uh, yeah, let's do our final song here, which uh, is not quite as complicated in terms of chords. And uh, hopefully my vocal apparatus can withstand this next one. But uh, let's go ahead and get to that. And thank you, Golgan Egg, for the hydrate. Let's get to that, too. Uh, there we go. Hydrate. Thank you, Golgana. A very special bonus song because of that incredible level of extra support here. This song is entitled Jolene. This is a classic, and you might well recognize it, although there are a few modifications here to make this song a little bit more relevant to my colleagues out there in the sciences. Science, as many of us know, can be a cutthroat discipline. Many modern scientists are overworked and criminally underpaid. We're forced to compete for the same paltry resources, fighting tooth and nail to get the same grants in order to continue our research, put food on our tables, and it seems like it's an area of diminishing returns year after year. This song is about the plight of modern scientists. It's kind of a ballad of perennially underfunded researchers. It's called Jolene. It goes like this. Begging of you, please don't take my grant. Jolene, 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 Jolene. Please don't, please don't take it, even though you can. Your research is impressive stuff. Surely it is good enough for tenure. You don't need the funds, Jolene. Your papers are exemplary. Citations, you got so much more than me, and I cannot compete with you, Jolene. Jolene, 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 Jolene. I'm begging of you, please don't take my grant. Jolene, 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 Jolene. Please don't take it just because you can. And I could easily understand how you could easily take my grant, but you don't know what it means to me, Jolene. And you could have your choice of dough, but I could never get funds on so short notice is my only hope, Jolene. And I had to have this talk with you my research goals depend on you and whatever you decide to do, Jolene. Jolene, 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 Jolene. I'm begging of you, please don't take my grant. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody for helping me feel so much more like like Jolene herself, so well-funded than the singer of that song. Thank you for your incredible support. 
I appreciate that more than you know, and Freya, I'm glad you think that's the best one. I... Yeah, that's a heartfelt song. Goes out to all of the underfunded scientists out there in our modern world. Kurnow says, worth coming in late. Thank all of the supporters who gifted subs. And again, congratulations to chat for getting the million dollar question correct. Very, very nice. Good stuff. This is a wonderful way to wrap up the week. And so with that, we will wrap up our week here. I hope to see you all on Monday. I will only be streaming Monday and Friday and Saturday next week. Maybe on Sunday too, but we'll see. Thank you, thank you everybody for all of your support. And don't go away just yet. We're going to go raid into another science channel here. But I want to give an extra special thanks to everybody whose names are showing up here in the chat. Without you... This channel would not be possible. Whether you just found me today and followed, or whether you gifted a subscription today, whether you moderated, whether you lurked, whether you asked questions, whether you chatted, whatever, thank you for your support. But maybe most especially to those of you who supported the channel financially, I, uh, your material support is what allows me to do this five days a week. So thank you very, very much for that. I am deeply, deeply grateful, humbled by your support and your generosity. What a privilege to be able to bring science content to you. And uh, thank you for that, for that privilege. I have no words apart from that. Now we... are going to go raid into Cyant Streams. And we are going to see some Cyant's news of the week with Belint and... Will Lita make an appearance? Looks like it's just Belint today. But Belint and his wife Lita are both research scientists on the east coast of the United States. They are both... They do active work in the sciences. They run experiments. They publish scientific papers. And they're excited to share their perspective on science with you. So let's go hang out there. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. And I will see you over there in science streams, everybody. Take care. Thank you again. I hope to see you on Monday. Bye-bye. Drop me a, a lovely beverage item. Um... And tonight, travel the world. Later. Later.